So um, it is time, so I'd like to start the webinar. Um, welcome to the Access to Space for All series of webinars on conducting R&D in hypergravity microgravity. My name is Kazuki Mori of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar. So today we will focus on technology demonstration. It is the seventh webinar of our nine webinar series. We're more than halfway through. And yet yeah, today we will focus on technology demonstration. So before we begin, um, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping rules. So first, please make sure to turn off your cameras and microphones at all times. Second, um, if you have any questions, comments, please use the chat box. Um, we will have a dedicated Q&A session at the end, but you do not wait and you do not have to wait until then. So please um, shoot us any questions you have in the chat box. Third, um, please answer our questionnaire that we will put on in the chat box later on. My colleague Wenbin will be active in the chat, so he will be pro providing useful links and also the link to our questionnaire. So we would really, really appreciate it if you can answer the questionnaire form for us. And lastly, um, if you are using social media, please use the hashtag access to space for all to help us promote this webinar. We are active on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, at UNUSA. So um, this is what our webinar has been looking like. Um, we started from April, starting with the introduction to hypergravity and microgravity, and we've been focusing on specific scientific topics, and today will be the last of the specific sessions. So um, today will be on technology demonstration. And from next week, we will shift a bit. So um, next week, we will have a session dedicated to our UN USA opportunities. We have five opportunities under the hypergravity and microgravity track, and our partners will be giving us um, an explanation of each of the programs. And also after the webinar, so we will have a one and a half hour webinar um, explaining about our UN USA opportunities. But after that, we will have a dedicated session for the drop test sixth round. So the sixth round is open currently until the end of June. And we would like to have a Q&A session dedicated to drop tests. So if you have any questions regarding drop tests, which is open, um, which the sixth round is open right now, please um, join us and ask us questions on um, both us and our partners, Zarm will be there to answer any questions. So any administrative questions, so about the um, announcement of opportunity, the application form, and also any technical um, problems or questions that you have, um, Zarm will be able to address that. So please join us. Um, we'll actually join us for the webinar and um, stay until um, stay for the whole thing while we do the drop test sixth round Q and A. And the final webinar will be about the regional activities um, inviting space agencies and other organizations. So I, I just want to emphasize again, I know many of you have been coming to our webinars, but to our newcomers, I just want to say that the main objective of this webinar series is to really raise awareness of the many types of R&D done in hypergravity and microgravity and to really trigger the interest in this amazing field. And through these webinars, we really want to be able to provide medical <laughs> A one letter picture. Hear someone. Three hundred picture only. Hold on. Let me try to mute that. Or Robin, can you try to mute that person right now? Okay. So I'm sorry. Going back. Um, through these webinars, we really want to be able to provide theoretical knowledge that can support hands-on opportunities, such as the programs under our Access to Space for initiative and other available opportunities um, that are out there. So the learning outcomes of these webinars are the fundamental special characteristics and advantages of hypergravity and microgravity, the overview of what type of research can be done in hypergravity and microgravity and its applications. Third, the overview of the available modified gravity platforms and area of applications for that as well. Fourth, how to develop an experiment to be conducted in hypergravity and microgravity. So especially for today, um, we'll be able to learn about um, when you want to do a technology demonstration experiment in hypergravity and microgravity, you will be able to learn what you need to know in the technical aspects. And finally, um, an overview of the available experiment opportunities and existing networks and experts. So um, just for you to know, the links for all the webinars are all the same. So um, you can use this link that you use to join this one um, for our future um, webinars as well. Okay, and our updates 
will be all posted to the Access to Space for All Initiative main website, um, which is the first link you see there. The webinar recordings and presentations will be posted to a different link, um, which is called the Past Webinars of Access to Space for All Initiative, but it is all um, linked to our main website. So if you get lost, just go to our main Access to Space for All Initiative website. Um, also, the recordings can be found on our YouTube channel. I've organized a list. Um, you can see um, I've organized a list with the yellow, um, what do you call it, thumbnail. So I think it'll be easy for you to find it. Um, our YouTube channel is UN Office for Outer Space Affairs. So um, just to emphasize, um, as I've explained, the Access to Space for Our Initiative looks like this. And currently we have drop tests open. Um, it's open until June 30th. Um, please um, join us for our Q&A session that we will have next week to learn more about drop tests. Um, but as you can see, we have five opportunities under the hypergravity microgravity track, and we hope to open more soon. Um, OK, next page. So um, the webinar for today looks like this. Um, we will have two sessions, one in the morning, um, 1030 um, Central Eastern time, and then one in 430 um, Central Eastern time. So the 1031 looks like this. We will have our introduction to technology demonstration from Professor Chen, of the director, who is the director of the Institute of Quantum Electronics at Peking University. Um, after that, we will have the student talk, giving us an example of the technology demonstration that is done. Um, that will be provided by Olfa D'Angelo, um, who belongs to the Institute of Material Science and Space at DLR. And after that, we will have the Q&A. So just to give you some information, in the afternoon, um, we will have, for the introduction, we will have um, Dr. Hilda um, Stinuit from Ice Cube Business Development Space Application Services. And for the student talk, uh, we will have two students giving us 10 minutes each. Alvaro Romero Calvo from the University of Colorado Boulder and Yaroslav Hrubi from the Quantum Photonics Laboratory of Hasselt University. So um, now I'd like to get into the actual contents of today's webinar. So I would like to introduce to the floor Professor Chang. So um, let me introduce to you Professor Chang. Well, OK, sorry, my screen is a bit frozen. Please give me a second. OK, so Professor Chen is a professor in the School of Electronics, Engineering and Computer Science of Peking University. He is currently head of the Laboratory of Space Ultrafold Atoms at Peking University. He has been a director of the Institute of Quantum Electronics for 15 years. His research topics include fundamentals of quantum science and quantum technology, space fold atomic physics, multi-body quantum physics, Bose-Einstein condensation, um, both for me mixing, quantum simulation, atomic and molecule hyperfine spectros sorry, spectroscopy, fiber laser, comb generator, nova atomic cesium plus. So uh, as you can see, he has done a lot of things. And he has published over 200 papers in international journals. OK, I'd like to give the floor to um, Professor Chin. If you can share your screen and start your presentation, that would be fantastic. Dr. Ching, if you're talking, you're muted right now. So if you can um, turn on your microphone. Could you, could yeah, you hear we, me? We hear you and we see the presentation. OK. So uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, uh, the uh, scientific uh, experiment in future Chinese space station. So, may I ask uh, how long I could give a talk? 14, 45 minutes? Yeah, 45 minutes. Oh, okay. Thank you. So, uh, uh, my talk will be uh, six parts. So, <clears throat> the first one is uh, the background. Uh, one month ago, Ch China launched the, uh, the core <coughs> co module for Chinese space station. 
the Chinese space station will uh, be consists of a uh, core module, uh, like uh, this is a space for a room for the astronauts. So now we, uh, one week ago, we uh, launched the cargo. So they like uh, uh, facilities uh, for astronauts. So after that, uh, we, we, we launched uh, <coughs> uh, the man-made spaceship to carry the astronauts. And then next year, we will launch the experiment module for science, for module one and module two. So my experiment is in module two. And the Chinese space station take a long time to designing. So from beginning is from 2006. So get the uh, final uh, <coughs> decision is a 2006. Uh, 13. So the overall goal for our space station is to build a national level space, space laboratory, strive to make a major breaking through in science and technology. And we divided the six uh, parts uh, for uh, basic physics in microgravity. So this is the uh, four parts. Uh, so uh, space cold atom physics, so is a one important uh, experiment. So we, we uh, build up uh, 12 uh, the racks. So one of the rack is a cold atom physics rack. So this is a <coughs> the uh, science module two. Uh, so in E, the position E is for cold uh, Felix uh, rack. Uh, beside the Chinese uh, space station for cold uh, American uh, NASA they already launched the uh, cold atom laboratory uh, in 2008. So they want to uh, do some uh, uh, actual low temperature experiment. So uh, this is our, their purpose. Uh, they united uh, six groups, uh, include the three group is a, a Nobel Prize winner to do uh, many challenge experiment in uh, space staging. So this is their space staging uh, for the cold atom laboratory. So this is a rack, and uh, they use the technique is the so-called atom chip to cut the very cold atom. And uh, this is a routing for their, uh, for experiment. So this is a space station, and uh, the, the platform is on there, and they use uh, the communication uh, route to control, to remote control the experiment. So this is the first paper they published on Nature uh, last year. So observation of boson condensate in the Earth orbit uh, research level. Uh, the, their first uh, motivation want to cut the 100 uh, peak Kelvin temperature, but uh, they failed. They only cut the uh, nano Kelvin because uh, uh, there, is, there is some uh, problem for their early experiment. But they are still where <coughs> improved the experiment and united with uh, cooperated with the uh, Germany uh, Germany team to improve the experiment. In future, they will uh, cut a further low temperature. Uh, as for European, uh, they we call the ESA. They also do the experiment in coded in, in space. Uh, they have a, a big plan to uh, use the international China, uh, international space station to do experiment. But uh, they do lots of experiment in the job tower and then use a sunny rocket. So this is a sunny rocket in 2017. 
So uh, the main the group is uh, from United of Hanover. Uh, they successfully uh, launched uh, the code atom. Uh, they also use the uh, atom chip to, and they got the BEC and, and do the interferometer experiment. Uh, the earliest experiment done is by the French Institute of Optics that they, they carried in 2011. They use uh, parabolic uh, airplane so do the zero though zero gravity experiment. So you can see the scientists can floating on the <clears throat> in the uh, in the space of the uh, flight. And they also but they use a different uh, configuration. They use the uh, so called uh, op optical trap. So and they use the laser system is a uh, use the fiber lasers. So this is the <clears throat> list for four country. They are a comparison for different experiment. So the temp temperature for United States want to use the, the target is a, uh, 100 picaven and the China is also the same. But we use different uh, uh, method. So we use uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, three-dimension optical trap. They, but they use the atom trap, so it's uh, different. And uh, so this is a Chinese uh, space station uh, called atom Felix rack. And uh, with on this kind of uh, facility, we want to do experiment for four kinds experiment. One is the quantum state for, of MET, and the second is the celestial body simulation, and the, the third one is quantum computation. The fourth one is the frontier exploration experiment. So we joined uh, many uh, universities and uh, research institutes uh, from Science Academy uh, to finish uh, many uh, complex, difficult experiments. The why we need the, <coughs> uh, the space, the uh, gravity, the uh, microgravity situation, because uh, in the uh, space we can got a very low temperature, uh, 100 minus 12 Kelvin. So that means they are. Uh, 12 zero Kevin, the point after point of the dot. So <clears throat> we compare to the, uh, this is we call the Kevin, we call the uh, absolute temperature. So zero Kevin is uh, equal to minus 2073.15 centigrade degree. So for room temperature is uh, we Say around the 70 uh, degree centigrade is around the uh, equal to 300 Kelvin. So that's why you can see we want to got a uh, fairly low temperature, uh, around the 14 uh, order, uh, lower than the uh, room temperature. So in the space. So this is a big challenge. Also, in the space, uh, we can have a very long time, 20 seconds for observation. Uh, this is also three orders longer than on the, on the ground. So the on the ground is only 20 milliseconds. And in the space, we can cut a very uniform, no gravity potential. So this is also very important. And we can uh, integrate uh, the four times of uh, uh, Nobel Prize uh, results, research results, and uh, uh, used for uh, space experiments. So now we, I will introduce uh, why we can 
uh, obtain 100 Kelvin in the space station in the microgravity uh, uh, environment. So let's uh, uh, remember the the human, the people uh, to uh, cut a low temperature is a uh, <coughs> uh, is from uh, the scientist uh, on us. So they uh, cut a low uh, cold that uh, the matter to cut the killing for uh, is a, is around the uh, uh, three Kelvin. Uh, so then, so this is a uh, now in most the people uh, most used in the um, um, nuclear magnetic and resonant imaging in the hospital. So this is a really low temperature mat. And uh, then the then got the very interesting phenomena, superfluidity and the superconductivity. So Barton gave the explanation and also they obtained the second Nobel Prize. And uh, the scientist, uh, Dr. Lee, they uh, further called uh, the helium he 3 to the millikelvin. So this is a millikelvin. So uh, got the third uh, Nobel Prize. So Stephen Chu in uh, 1980, they used the Sisyphus crawling, got the uh, micro, micro uh, current, so the temperature. So this is a, they was a award the Nobel Prize in 1997. So this is the fourth Nobel Prize. And the uh, scientists uh, further called it to the nano Kevin. So three, another three scientists were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2001. So uh, this is for nano Kevin, but if we want to cut the peak Kevin further the so this is need to in on the space station. So in the microgravity uh, uh, environment. Uh, let's uh, explanation, give explanation why the red cooling can cut a very cold atom. So compared to the cryogenic cooling, so this is uh, only for liquid and the solid, they use the, the mechanical is uh, the collision. So they, uh, the, they the contain, use the container to uh, cut the uh, atom, uh, cut the material, so hold the material. But for laser cooling, they uh, just uh, the material is for atom and the molecule. They use the laser radiation pressure, and uh, the loading method is a magnetic field plus laser. But uh, this uh, method is very faster. They can cut the temperature is uh, 10 to minus 6 Kelvin. And uh, compared to uh, clean genic coring, this normal coring is uh, 10 to minus 3. So this is milk Kelvin. So this is a 3 order lower than the <coughs> traditional uh, cooling method. But uh, the very cold atom uh, the method is uh, called the average cooling. So this is also used uh, for the uh, gas for atom and molecule. So they use the uh, average cooling plus uh, collision. So they uh, use the method is a magneto optic uh, plus a laser. So this is a very faster. They can cut the nano cable. But uh, if they want to cut a peak cabin, they need uh, another method. So uh, why the laser can code item? So we can see uh, this is uh, the tradition of the model for atom. So 
the lead part is what we call the nuclear. And uh, the <coughs> this uh, blue part is the circle, uh, the orbit of the uh, electron. So this is uh, the we call the ground orbit. Uh, so the corresponding to the energy is uh, E1. And uh, also this uh, the second orbit, the, this is the high energy. So this is the E2 correspond. So uh, the gap of these uh, two levels, uh, the energy is uh, omega zero. And the atom is a flight from the left to right with the velocity, with the speed of V. So now we emit the laser from the right to left. So the photo, the frequency is omega. Then the atom see the uh, photons, the frequency is not omega, omega uh, because uh, there is a velocity. So they need a plus the uh, velocity, the so-called Doppler effect. So if uh, they uh, satisfy uh, omega kV equals uh, their central uh, the energy gap, omega zero, so they any, the atom will be uh, absorb the photon from the ground state to the upper state, and then spontaneous again. So then spontaneous emission, we emission the the energy is omega zero. So that means they absorb the <coughs> low energy and the emission the high energy. Then we will lose loss the energy. The loss energy is kinetic energy, so they will be cold. The speed will be, uh, be uh, decrease, and they be cold and cooler. The temperature will be decrease. So this is the principle. So we can calculate the how much then one times it, it absorb the photon. Uh, the speed, how much they will be changed. So, because the photon, for photon, the momentum, each momentum they absorb is a h bar k. So the velocity we can calculate in for each time, they can change uh, three centimeter per second. So that means it's a very, very small. But, uh, you know, the atom absorb the photon and the emission again, it's a very faster. So the faster rate is 10 to 10, 10 to 8 per second. So it is a very, very fast uh, the, the speed. In this way, so we can, the atom can, can cut a high uh, accelerate. And uh, if uh, the speed of uh, atom is at the beginning is uh, 100 meters second per second, uh, with the lead cooling, they can cool to zero. They only need uh, uh, 300,000 uh, absorb and the emission. And but this only take uh, three sec three milliseconds, so it's very fast. Then from uh, the cold atom from one kilometer to zero, and uh, the temperature at that time is around. They finally can cut uh, 100 micro uh, micro Kelvin. So this is uh, the Doppler Kelvin Doppler calling. So this means. From the room temperature to go to the 300 microcavern, uh, only need the three milliseconds. So they call the three six order magnitude. The, if we want to cut a further calling, we need the evaporating. 
evaporative cooling. Evaporative cooling is a very normal, uh, appeared in a normal life. If we drink the coffee, so we can, uh, if the coffee is very hot, so we can uh, let it uh, cool down with the evaporative uh, cooling. But the outcome for our uh, experiment is different because it's take a very long time for normal evaporative cooling. We need very fast. We need uh, several seconds to cool, but uh, for normal uh, cool needs uh, 10 to 20 minutes. So it's too long to us. But how to cut very fast? So we can uh, put the atom to a, a trap, and then we uh, let the atom. Uh, the if the high energy atom, so let it uh, uh, evaporate out, out of the go out of the trap, and uh, we uh, uh, we decrease the uh, depth of the trap, and continuously depth. So let the uh, high energy atom so go out of the trap and leave the uh, low energy atom. Uh, so then cliche again and the got got uh, got the parts of the atoms the energy low and low and the some high energy atom then will be uh, go out. So this is called the evaporative cooling. So this kind of evaporative cooling is a, we call the uh, force evaporative cooling. The force evaporative cooling, uh, in fact, uh, we need uh, a microwave. So this is a rubidium atom. So this is the structure of the atom. So in the structure, this kind of atom in the microgravity, so the the energy will be the level will be separate. We call the Zeeman effect. So when the atom in the trap, so in the bottom of the atom, is a, on, only the energy is a very low, the atom. But uh, if the any, energy high atom will be go up past, past this part. And we apply the uh, microwave here, so there will be tradition from this uh, level to this level. So this level is non trap uh, the, uh, the energy. So this way it escape from the trap. So in this way, the atom, we, uh, the high energy atom will be quickly uh, evaporated uh, to out of the trap. So then uh, leave the very, very uh, low energy atom in the in the bottom of the trap in this way so we can cut the very low temperature of the atoms so finally we can cut uh, the 50 nano kelvin so that means uh, uh, nine uh, point uh, zero nine nine zero the kelvin after the of the point so this is the, the, the experimental result in 1995. So we got the, the boson condensate uh, here with a very low temperature, you know, not Kevin. So three of scientists got the Nobel Prize in 2001. So this is the, the new matter predicated by uh, Einstein in 1924. Uh, he said, if the temperature is high, so the the particle behavior is a, is a, like a particle. But if the temperature is low, there will behave some wave wave like uh, behavior. But if the temperature is low, then the so called critical temperature uh, predicted by Einstein. So then, the the wavelengths will be uh, overlap. So this wavelength we call the Doppler Doppler uh, wavelength. So 
and uh, this is the inverse of the uh, temperature. So the temperature is low and the, the wavelength will be high. So they easily to overlap each other. So when they overlap each other, the each atom will be behave like a single atom, like a, uh, one atom. So that means uh, what <coughs> uh, one million atoms we behave like uh, one atom. So this is the we call the the fifth state of the matter uh, predicted by Einstein. So also we call the uh, post Einstein condensation. Also we call the uh, briefly call the BEC. So this is a uh, uh, in the low temperature we can got the uh, new matter. But why we uh, meets the in the space because uh, in the space so the uh, the trap I said it should be uniform but on the ground there is gravity the trap cannot be uh, this kind of uniform trap to loading the atoms so there, uh, there is a there, there, there will be uh, the gap the, the leakage for the for the trap so the, this uh, atoms will be uh, out, go out of the trap. So in this way, we meet, need a high uh, potential of the trap can loading the loading the trap loading the atoms. So enough atoms they can cut be easy. So uh, in this way, the energy is like this, and uh, the this uh, trap we can use the frequency to describe it. So the finally, we got the temperature is a, a related the, the frequency of the trap, but for uh, on the ground the trap, at least uh, you we have to got the 100 hertz. So then on the ground the, the finally temperature is around the 100 nanokelvin. But if we if we want to got a, a low frequency. Then it's in the microgravity, in the zero gravity, the situation. So in the uh, space, so we can space station, we can cut uh, this uniform, very shallow uh, uh, the trap. So we can finally cut uh, the peak Kelvin temperature. But uh, one problem is uh, when we cut. Uh, this very shallow temp uh, shallow trap, the creation of the atom is the rate is very slow. So they need the 100, 1000 seconds to creation. So this is not uh, allowed, uh, not to fit our uh, requirement. So we need to uh, uh, got a very fast uh, creation and a very, very fast, fast cooling but uh, got a peak Kelvin temperature. But how to cut this? So this is a challenge for us. So we propose the two-stage event cooling in space, in microgravity uh, micro environment. So the first uh, we use the class uh, cross uh, B, so got the uniform trap, and uh, then we uh, decrease the optic trap, uh, the depth of the trap, and then we plus another uh, wide diameter trap. So then the atoms will be adiabatic uh, diffusing in this trap and uh, decrease the temperature fastly. So finally, we can get a very low temperature. So this is the simulation of our experiment. Uh, when the first stage we got the nano Kelvin, and the, the second stage we got the peak Kelvin. Uh, but uh, for United States and uh, Germany, they use the delta key coding uh, in a different uh, method. We compared the two methods. So in our method, is we can cut a seven peak Kelvin, but uh, in delta key coding, they can cut a, a seventy-five peak Kelvin. Kelvin. So in our case, we can cut one order lower than the data key coding. Uh, in different uh, microgravity, 
So also we can get a, a more a low temperature. For example, 10 to minus 2 uh, G uh, is a equal. The temperature is similar to the 10 to minus 4 uh, for the delta key coding. So in this case, so they need a more uh, less small uh, microgravity. So this is also uh, advantage for the, our two stage coding. So how to uh, verify this kind of for uh, uh, calculation. So we uh, build uh, this system. Uh, this system is uh, mainly used in the science chamber to the experiment to demonstration uh, our method. So we uh, apply the cross beam uh, for uh, for laser for the very first is a very thin uh, diameter and then we plus a wide diameter uh, laser. So we got the, the temperature and then the, this is the first stage and then second stage we can got a, a very low temperature. So that got a, a three nano Kelvin on the ground. But on the ground we should uh, balance the gravity. So we need the, the anti, uh, anti particle four uh, thermoscope coil to uh, balance the gravity, but uh, still the, there is a problem because uh, there is a noise of the magnetic field, so there is a limitation. So we can only cut the three nano Kelvin. But uh, on the on the space, so we don't need uh, uh, the this uh, magnetic coil. Uh, don't need to uh, balance the uh, gravity. We can cut the even low temperature through the uh, peak Kelvin. So this experiment shows uh, if for no uh, balance coil, uh, limitation coil, so the atom only ground the, the temperature the 100 nano Kelvin. But uh, uh, if we got a very low uh, the the trap, so the atoms will be leaked to the out of the trap. So we use a magnetic field to balance the it. So uh, limited the atoms, so we can get an even low temperature to nano Kelvin, one uh, three nano Kelvin. So this is uh, our experiment three nano Kelvin. So also we uh, do the experiment to we use the uh, uh, the trap, the frequency, and the, this temperature. We finally see the uh, around the several. Uh, Hertz and we cut the several nano Kelvin. And also we uh, demonstrate the uh, delta key coding. Delta key coding is uh, at first we have a trap and then we uh, switch off the trap and uh, the atoms uh, is uh, uh, expand freely and then we plus trap again. So they will give it a trap, uh, give it a pulse of the force to call the atoms. But uh, they need the, the accurately control the temperature T1 and the T2 to uh, satisfy this kind of formulation. So uh, we can calculate the different uh, uh, temperature, different formulation, a uh, different time. And uh, finally, we got the temperature. Uh, so this is uh, the, the actual low temperature for the same uh, laser system. So finally, they got the 33 nano Kelvin. So this is uh, around uh, 10 times uh, larger than the user's two-stage coding. So this is uh, uh, verify our uh, theory. But uh, on, the, uh, <coughs> on the space station, there is a uh, the one disadvantage because there is a violation. So this is a uh, this is a, a, a international space station. There has a violation uh, the spectrum. So we also calculating 
So what the vibration, vibration, how to influence the this later cooling. So the temperature you can see uh, with the time they will increase. So the vibration, uh, the this amplitude of the vibration with the frequency. So uh, the results is tell us if the frequency is less than 50, the, the temperature will be uh, be high, will be increased, and the atoms will be lost, uh, lost, uh, lost match. So we also use an experiment to demonstrate. It. So the frequency is less than 20 hertz, the atom level uh, number will be lost uh, degrees uh, rapidly. So this is the this part and this is this part. So the frequency is larger than 20 hertz, so we will not uh, influence. So this is our experiment. And uh, so now the experiment uh, is uh, carry on for uh, next year. So well, we have a main uh, two main institute. From one is uh, my institute, uh, Peking University. Uh, we are uh, scientific PI. So the institute, our group is the one of the pioneer called it in uh, China. So this is the first CSU mart uh, in 1996. We achieved and the first B uh, atom laser based on first BEC paper. So in 2006. So we built up uh, the ground prototype uh, the system to demonstrating the, the our experiment. This is Nobel Prize we know what concatenator to fit us, and uh, this is the whole system. Uh, and we achieved a, a BEC. And then we transfer our experiment e experience for the science experiments to the uh, to the Shanghai Institute of Optical and Fine Mechanics. So this is a, a project PI. So because the space station for the cold atom uh, product the is a, a build up in this institute. Uh, this institute is also the pioneer of code editing in China. So <clears throat> uh, they also published the uh, first laser cooling paper in 1989 and uh, got a low temperature, low, uh, low than the Doppler limit. So 30, uh, 33 microfarad, and they got the first BEC in China, 2003. So this is the the building I do experiment there, and uh, the, this is their designing. And uh, so system is uh, include the physics uh, sub system and ex uh, electronic and the and the laser system. So this is a physical unit. So this is. Uh, uh, the Shanghai Institute uh, the, the teams they, they do the testing of the uh, setup. So there are seven uh, key technology. One is a uh, all fiber laser technology. So this second is a high frequency fast locking technology. The third one is a laser power stabilization and the fast locking te technology. The first one, fourth one is a uh, the control they use F FPGA control because uh, in on the on the ground we often use the level view but uh, we cannot use the level view software to control the system on the on the space and uh, this is the 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 magnetic field trap the control large current and uh, finally we got the optical latest technology and this is a fast transition from superfluidity to not normal liquid. This is for science. So based on this, we have a sick, uh, at, the, at the beginning, we have a, a four experiments. Uh, based on, uh, we call it quantum simulation experiment. Uh, so 
because on the space we can got a very nice experiment with a very low uh, tunneling uh, because of, with the low temperature we can got a very uh, low tunneling so to uh, observe the, this uh, uh, phenomena so uh, the phenomenon will be obviously in the low temperature for for example Higgs mode will appear in the low temperature so we, we did a uh, full experiment for the first stage for what we call the constructing period. The first experiment is a quantum magnetism experiment proposed by uh, Liu Wu Ming Liu, so in the Institute of Physics. So they want to do the experiment to uh, for the uh, first tradition from the ferromagnetic to the uh, <coughs> paramagnetic experiment to demonstrate the quantum magnetism. The second is a proposed about Xiao Ji Zhou in Peking University. They want to uh, build up a novel quantum state. They use Kagome uh, latest to do the experiment. The third one is a, uh, by Baolong Li uh, yeah, in uh, Wuhan Institute. They want to do creation uh, a caustic uh, black hole to demonstrating Hawking radiation. And the fourth experiment is uh, by, proposed by Zhou uh, Yu in Shanghai Institute. So he wanted to do experiment with uh, uh, FMO effect. So in the very low temperature, he can observe this peak, but on the ground, they cannot observe this peak. So this is the full experiment, but uh, uh, after that, because we have a lifetime for 10, so at the beginning we have four years to the full experiment and another six years we do another serious experiment. There are four serious experiments around the uh, 15 experiment. First one is the quantum simulation, the second one is the quantum state of the mat, the third one is the precision uh, testing of physics physical theory, and uh, another one is the dark mate, this is a, uh, this kind of experiment. So for summary, so <clears throat> uh, actual, excellent actual code atom physics requirement and required experiment condition for microgravity. The space actual code atom experiment uh, cabinet or rack we became a idea platform to private such experiment condition. The space uh, ultra code atom physics is an important result of a combined basic research and the aerospace engineering. And it is also a good opportunity to simulate like simultaneous develop, development of Chinese uh, aerospace science and technology with the world aerospace and technology. And uh, the Archer code atom physics experiment platform is currently mostly complex physical scientific research system on space station. The successful development has uh, played an important role in promoting developing Chinese space science and the uh, Archer code Physics. So, scientific scientist team of Chinese Chinese archaeological atom physics has a uh, mentored and we show our important role in future international code atom physics and the space uh, science experiment. Uh, this is uh, our team in Peking University, but I'm sorry, I have not picture for Shanghai Institute team. And uh, so finally, I would uh, like to thank to a uh, colleague of Shanghai Institute of Optics and Fine Mechanics and uh, thank the colleague of uh, Code Atom Science for Space and thank all the friends of the world for their support. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Spencer. It's really informative and presentation. I think we were able to learn a lot about open code atomic physics and that it relates to the combination of basic research and engineering. A really great example of that. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, uh, attending. Yeah. So I will, should I spot share the presentation? Yeah, you can oh. stop sharing the presentation okay. because next I will introduce um, Opa, um, who is our student speaker. So, okay. so Opa is a researcher in applied physics and engineering. Um, she is pursuing a doctorate at the RWTH Aachen University in Germany. And she is employed by a German Aerospace Center DLR in the Institute of Material Physics in Space. Um, her work concentrates on understanding how materials behavior changes with variations in the gravitational environment and using properties to design new technologies for applications in space and on ground. In particular, um, based on her work on the flow of granular media, uh, media in absence of gravity, she developed a process to control and 3D print powders in space. So I'd like to give the floor to Ulfa now. Okay, well, um, thank you very much. Um, really, really happy to be talking to you today. And uh, what I will be sharing with you, uh, I, so I cannot, um, maybe you can go to the next slide. Um, yes, so my name is Olfa D'Angelo. I come from the Institute of Material Science, uh, Material Physics in Space, uh, part of the DLR. And uh, today we will talk about uh, granular rheology and how I have applied it to 3D printing in space. Um, and um, so we can move on. Um, first of all, I was asked to give you a bit of uh, background on who I am. And so here you can see me um, a few years ago. Uh, and you can see that I already had some interest in space research. And therefore, after um, having completed studies in material science and engineering, I did my master thesis at uh, ESA with a spaceship program. And this is something I wanted to point out to you because I know a lot of students are listening. So it's a, it exists in many of the ESA facilities around Europe and it's uh, quite a nice opportunity. And so anyway, then I continued um, with a PhD on powder-based additive manufacturing for space. And um, yeah, next slide. So here, it's a video, you can play it. Um, we can, uh, first, why would we want to 3D print in space? Well, if we have a look at some of the next projects of humans in space, so here you've seen the moon, uh, the moon village having a satellite around the moon with, of course, the goal to go eventually to Mars, uh, the red planet. Um, all of those projects involve, um, next slide, involve um, long endurance missions. So missions where you will have to um, not rely on ground support. Uh, long endurance and long duration missions where you will need to be able to solve unforeseen issues and um, for example, to directly manufacture tools or spare parts as you need them. And uh, this means that we need manufacturing technologies that work under low gravity or microgravity. And uh, the best would be that those technologies function with um, sufficient amount of different materials, in particular metals, polymers, and ceramics. Um, of course, with recycled materials for self-sustainability of mission, and if possible, with in-situ resources. So, for example, regolith, this sound uh, found on planetary surface. You can click. So, again, basically, um, additive manufacturing will be an enabling technology for the future space missions. And uh, actually, there is 
already an additive manufacturing in space as we speak. So on the ISS, uh, since 2014 was the first technology demonstration mission, there are FDM based, so filament based additive manufacturing techniques. Here is a principle, but I bet you all already know it because it's the most well-known type of additive manufacturing. Next slide. And um, this uh, technology has um, shown that it's extremely useful in space because many, many functional parts, the astronauts have um, printed many parts which have enabled scientific experiment to take place. Um, however, there is also the problem that this type of additive manufacturing has creates parts of relatively low quality and um, can intrinsically only work with thermoplastics for, for physical reasons. So there is a need for new um, technologies. We can move on. There is a need for new technologies that would have higher resolution and higher dimensional accuracy. And of course, that uh, could enable to print from many different types of materials. And if we look at how this is done here on Earth, um, what is used in industry are powder bed based additive manufacturing processes. And next slide. This has uh, actually, there is one team who tried to develop such powder bed based process for space. And um, what they do is um, because, of course, when you get to microgravity and handling powders in microgravity, the problem is that to stabilize the powder bed. And so, what they propose is to stabilize it by an airflow. Uh, basically sucking on the powder bed to um, stabilize it. And this technique, um, you can check out the publication, I think it's very interesting and very amazing. Um, it also has limitations, basically that the parts you can print are of a very limited size. And this means that there was a space for developing a new technology, and um, this is what I've done, we can move on to the next slide. Um, th this has been my work, so trying to develop uh, powder handling technology. And first, I want us to look at uh, why is it even difficult to handle powders in microgravity. And in order to do this, there, I, I wanted to show you this video, which is basically a very simple, very normal powder, but in microgravity. And as you can see, it doesn't at all react how we would expect it. Um, so actually, the, the grains, as soon as they get close to one another, they create a cluster. And then you have the different floating cluster. And when two clusters come close to another, they remain close to each other. And um, we can have a, a little look at the physics of this to try to understand it better. And this will be on the next slide. Um, and here we look at two grains. And of course, this is extremely simplified. But it's just a way uh, for me to try to explain to you what is the mental process you have to go through to try to develop um, processes for microgravity. And so as I was saying, here we have those two grains. And we are looking at the force that one grain um, creates when it gets to the vicinity of the other one. And um, those are the ele electrostatic, capillary, and van der Waals forces are cohesive forces. So they tend to uh, make the grains stick together. And on the other hand, the green line here is gravity. So it is the result of the mass of one grain. And as you can see, if uh, you click once, when we remove gravity, the only force that was there to make the powder flow is removed, which means that, of course, the grains, as soon as they get sufficiently close to one another, they will stick together and cluster. And this explains why we have the feeling that powder seems to be more cohesive in microgravity. And now if we uh, jump to the next, 
we can go a little bit more uh, into the topic and look at the the process that I developed. And um, there you have to imagine a closed container completely filled with raw material. And inside this container is a platform. On top of this platform is a printing substrate on which the printing will happen. So at the beginning of the process, the platform is all the way down inside the container. And then it goes up incrementally, step by step, as the object is printed uh, layer by layer under it, which means that we need to have an energy source placed under the container that selectively solidifies it as it goes up. So summarizing first step is incremental rise of the process. And actually, because we don't want the powder to be under direct compression between the platform and the top wall of the container, it's not so much a platform, but um, a cylinder. Then second step uh, is material deposition, which consists of first downward transport, and this is realized by a screw conveyor. Second, homogenization, and this is realized by um, horizontal shaking. And third, uh, compression. So the platform goes back down in order to put the newly deposited layer under compression and therefore to increase its density and force it to degase. And finally, of course, we have the selective solidification. And so now you know basically uh, the process and I just want to kind of zoom in on what happens um, during the um, uh, downward transport of the powder. I told you there is a screw conveyor that rotates and as it rotates the blades push the material downward. And um, this creates force chains because force chains are basically how powders, um, how forces are transmitted in powders, which means that a network of force chains is created. And of course, in a sense, this is what we want <laughs> because we want forces to be transported, we want the powder to flow, but we also have to be very careful because what we absolutely want to avoid is that the powder jams and um, which would completely stop the process. So in order to create those force chains, but also avoid them becoming too stable, we want to disturb them. So always disrupt the force chain as soon as they are created. And this we do by also rotating this inner tube that I mentioned before. And this way we create a new force field orthogonal to the to the first one um, in order to always both create those force chains and after that destabilize them. And there is just one last um, thing that I have not mentioned. In this process, uh, you've now understood that what we absolutely want is to be adaptable. So we want to be able to use it under any gravitational level and for any type of material. And in order to make this happen, we probe the rheology of the material in situ, which means as the material is inside the process, we probe it rheologically by recording the shear stress as this um, inner tube is rotating. And um, depending on the results of this in situ probing, we, we can modify the process parameters. There you can click a few times so that as you see, we know what the material flowability is, uh, we probe that and then we modify the process parameters as a function of this. Okay, I think now you know everything about the process itself and we can move on to really the technology demonstration. And uh, the first idea when you want to do a technology demonstration is let's do it as cheap and easy as possible. Um, and the best way to do this or the first idea you would have is to use simulation. And this is what I did. So I used the M simulation, discrete element model. Um, and it was very good as a first approximation, but you're also in this method limited 
uh, in the number of particles you can simulate. So um, it's, uh, it, it also doesn't give a final proof of concept. Next option would be to use continuum approach. Um, but at the moment, there is, oops, we're going a bit too fast there. Um, so I was, I was saying, next option would be to use continuum approach. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but there is at the moment no constitutive equations that would encompass all states of granular materials. So there is no um, constitutive equation to rely on for such continuum approaches. So as you've now all seen, uh, this option is not good. So for the experimental proof of concept, we have to rely on experiments. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the first step was to build prototypes. And now you can uh, see this uh, image of one of the prototypes. Um, and using, uh, so we built two and using those prototypes, uh, did experiments first on ground and then in microgravity. And um, to do technology demonstration in microgravity, we need to have an experimental platform. We have now heard a lot with a really nice previous talk um, about the, the type of platform that can give you a really long time in microgravity, and this is great. But for a first demonstration, so a first proof of concept, you usually rely on um, other type of platforms. And for me, what I use is a parabolic flight. Um, I'm not going to talk in much detail about it. I'm, I'm happy if there are questions to answer. Um, but in a few words, a plane describes a parabola. Um, when it's at the top of the parabola, it's in free fall, you get 22 seconds of microgravity. Next slide. Okay, and this is uh, also a video of uh, myself with a colleague working really, really hard um, during one of the parabolas. Um, because as I was saying, everything in the plane is in free fall, so including the experimenter. And uh, I just wanted to show you this because, of course, the work of a scientist is extremely hard and a lot of work. And then sometimes there are 22 seconds of fun. Um, and I also wanted to use this opportunity to advertise an opportunity, a flight opportunity that um, I was very lucky to get and that any of you as a student might also be able to get. And it's a ESA Education Fly Your Thesis program. Um, it's, uh, it's very nice because you create an experiment as a team and um, are really supported throughout the process. So it was just a little uh, commercial break because I, I think this is really something to remember for all of you. And if we continue, this was, so you see the two prototypes on the parabolic flight plane and um, the team working on it during the parabolic flight. And if we continue, we can move on to the results. And first of all, for this technology demonstration, uh, I used two demonstrator powders. The first one, which will appear is a smooth surface high flowability powder. And the second one is uh, the surface is roughened by dry coating it with a really angular powder to get a low flowability powders. And um, so using those two powders as demonstrators to see if we can handle and 3D print also from low flowability powders. And first result I want to show you, and um, because I think it's extremely interesting, is more coming back to the rheology of those powders. So we have here on top uh, the results on ground, and in, uh, so A and B, and C and D at the bottom are the results in microgravity. And there are many interesting things to see on those graphs, but what I really want to point out is that you see that the stresses are always higher in microgravity than on ground. 
so on this uh, stress strain curves where strain basically you could replace by time um, you have all, it's always more difficult requires more energy input to shear the material in microgravity and actually this is I, I think this is a little bit surprising but if you remember what we've seen at the beginning of the talk uh, with how cohesive interactions become predominant in microgravity, and maybe it's not, uh, not so surprising. And um, we, can, we can also go, move on to the results, not on the rheology part, but on the 3D printing part, um, because this, it was actually a um, successful technology demonstration in the sense that we managed to 3D print fully in microgravity samples from both the high flowability and the low flowability powders. And it was actually the first time a low flowability powder was 3D printed fully in microgravity. And on the next slide, we can have a look using computed tomography throughout the samples. Um, and we see that they are nicely homogeneous throughout and, uh, and have high density for both powders. And um, on this, we can move on to the conclusions. I, I hope I convinced you that additive manufacturing will be an enabling technology for space exploration, and that there are still many new processes to develop and which could definitely be developed by you. Um, especially, I think there is a, a need for a new 3D printing process um, using metals, metals that will use high precision and produce minimal amount of waste. And also in general to handle granular materials in extreme environment because on the moon or on Mars, um, the, the surface is completely covered in regolith in this um, granular material. And then more regarding the experimental platforms for altered gravity. Uh, I wanted to point out that I believe there is really a need for those experimental platforms because um, they enable us to get reliable proof of concepts also when working with materials that are not so easy to simulate. And in the end, um, you also eventually need to have an experiment for the technology demonstration. Um, and uh, finally, I thank everybody who made it possible for me to be here and talk to you. And I also wanted to conclude on a very personal note, because I think we often say that um, as, a, as a scientist uh, working in the space domain, you need to have a lot of knowledge. And this is definitely true. You rely a lot on knowledge. But I think there are two extremely important uh, qualities also, which are imagination and creativity. Because to imagine a world without gravity, you 100% rely on your ability to imagine things. Um, and of course, to develop new process, creativity is the base. So on this, um, I want to thank you very much. And I hope you have many questions. Vibration of the, uh, the space station will be much influence the, the temperature of the atoms for our coding. But uh, how to uh, uh, overcome overcome the, this kind of uh, for influence? Of, uh, so we uh, designing the uh, levitation system. So magnetic, uh, electron mag magnetic uh, levitation system so when we do experiment, we can levitation uh, our system to isolate the vibration from the environment. So in this way, we can cut uh, uh, the maybe 10 to minus uh, 5 uh, G uh, gravity. So in this way, I think it's uh, much better for uh, <clears throat> our experiment yeah so this is a uh, what we do uh, in our <coughs> space station so uh, thank you for the clear answer um i hope um mad van that answers your question and um, we will move on to the next one which is from opa actually to dr chen so where does the vibration from the iss come from 
Is it motors, human presence, other experiments, um, apparatus creating the viable environment for astronauts? Um, because on rockets and CubeSats, vibrations are minimal. So, yeah, um, Opa is asking where the vibration from the space station comes from. Oh, this is also the uh, good questions. You know, the <coughs> uh, space station is uh, quite different from satellite because uh, this is a, a, a large system for supporting the people to live in. So that's why they need uh, many uh, different uh, f facility compared to the satellite. So it's a more complex. For, for example, they uh, need uh, the, the so-called uh, uh, fluid, uh, uh, fluid system. Uh, so they can uh, call uh, some, call, uh, make uh, the, some system, if they're heating, uh, the temperature too high, they can call it. But, uh, you know, when the some fluid is a flow in the system in the pipe, there still there is a, some uh, uh, vibration will be uh, generate, and uh, also uh, the astronaut then when they are moving uh, in the space station, this way also uh, make the vibration for the uh, space station. So many, uh, many parameters, many, <clears throat> uh, how to say, the, the actors, so, so factors, we influence, we generate the vibration in the space station. So, so that's why when we do experiment in the uh, space station, we should uh, uh, seriously, seriously consider about how to solve this problem. So that's why we do the lots of uh, simulation, and uh, and uh, finally got the solution how to uh, solve this problem. Okay, thank you so much. The next question is from Madhavan as well. He is asking, I believe, to Dr. Chin, what is the power consumption for the whole experiment? Okay, um, so uh, this is uh, depend on our set satellite uh, the designing, and uh, uh, also they are uh, depending on how much the power of a battery, the sound battery. Uh, so. Now, the limitation for us, for each uh, uh, rack, the top, the assumption, uh, consume <coughs> some power is uh, around uh, 1,500 watt. This is a, a limitation for us, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next question I believe is, I, I'm not actually sure who I should address it to. Um, it's from Nit, Nish, Nishtis, I, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. So um, if we are manufacturing Zeblin cables successfully in microgravity, will it, uh, and make it use on the ground, will it affect Starlink in any way? So he's asking because um, purely on, only considering that Starlink has comparatively less delay than conventional used cables. So um, if we manufactured Zeblin cables on in microgravity, will it have any effect to other um, yeah, other um, cables or other services? So if you both have anything to add or um, add, um, comment on this. Opa? Um, I don't, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Chen, so, if you have, oh, or, sorry, Opa, yeah, then please, Opa, go. Yeah, I, I, I think I cannot uh, answer this uh, question because I don't really know. Um, however, 
I, I think there is a lot of talk about uh, manufacturing things in space and then bringing them back to Earth. I, I think this is not yet something that is realistic. Yet. No, very clear. Thank you. Um, Dr. Chin, do you have anything to add? No. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Um, thank you so much. The next question is from Bang. Um, he is asking, can the three D printer you be used for lab grown meat? Um, I think this is too old. <laughs> um, so yeah, you you could use it. So I'm gonna broaden a little bit from lab grown meat and talk about uh biological projects in general, and um, the um, about biological projects, the issue with 3D printing is that uh, you use yield stress fluids. So you want fluids that can uh, withstand their own weight. Um, and this is only on ground, um, given Earth's gravity. This is only working for very small structures. So basically your structure scrambles under its own weight eventually. Um, uh, I mean, this is one uh, problem I am aware of. And so therefore they are trying to do it in the space station. But the type of technology they are using there is more like ink deposition um, and not powder-based um, processes. Um, however, to answer more precisely your question, in principle, the process I presented, uh, you could use for colloids. Um, and so, in principle, you could use for complex fluids, including biological fluids. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Chen, do you have anything to add to this? <laughs> Sorry. So, I just uh, check the some uh, questions. So, I, yeah. So, temporarily, I have no questions here. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you very much. There was also one more question about does microgravity exist under any conditions? So for example, during space travel for astronauts from the ISS to the moon, um, maybe because we explained about parabolic flights and there was different levels of gravity, um, this question is coming up. Maybe Ulfa, can you help us um, answer this question? So I, I will repeat again, does, the mic does microgravity exist under any conditions, for example, during space travel for astronauts from the ISS to the moon, um, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I, I think this is actually a very deep question um, because every body with a mass exert a certain gravitational attraction. So um, if you are just uh, you yourself with your mass uh, are in a spaceship you will exert some gravity um, the question is how strong are those forces um, and they are very weak uh, because we are really light in comparison to a planet <laughs> and so yes uh, levels of where well, this is why uh, we talk about microgravity um, because we mean very, very small levels of gravity. Mm. Then if you meant it uh, in a more general way, I think, uh, so on the way in a, in a spaceship, on the way to, for example, Earth to Mars, you would have microgravity, mm, same Earth to Moon, but also uh, on the ISS, so on a satellite rotating around a planet, may it be Earth or the Moon, you will also have uh, microgravity. Then um, on, a, on a parabolic flight, for example, uh, the platform I was presenting, you generally say you have weightlessness because the level of microgravity is relatively um, not, not as good as uh, on other platforms, for example, the drop tower that you will hear about. Yeah, so all of this to say you can have very depending on what you're what you're looking for, what you're experimenting with, uh, 
you will look for different levels of microgravity and because it will be more or less important depending on on what you want to experiment with and every platform uh, has different offers different uh, drawbacks Okay, um, Ulfa, thank you so much for the clear answer. And I see that the person who asked is saying thank you. So I think this is perfect. So next, I'd like to introduce our speaker, um, Dr. Hilda Senoit from IceCube's Business Development Space Application Services. So um, before I give the floor um, to um, Hilda, I'd like to give you some uh, her bio. So Dr. Hilda is a seasoned research and team leader for Space Application Services. She received her master's in mathematics and applied physics and her PhD in plasma astrophysics from KUL, Catholic University Leuven, respectively in 1991 and in 1998. Since the completion of her PhD, she has been working with space application services. After working as operations specialist for the International Space Station modules and for spacecraft ATV in supports of EADS, now Airbus, at Le Morel, France. Um, she supported the setup for the Belgian User Support and Ops Center in Brussels, Belgium, to do the coordination of the science operations for Belgium Soyuz mission of astronaut Frank Devine. Afterwards, she started supporting ESA under a contract position, of which more than a decade in a function of ESA ISS Mission Science Office, doing scientific coordination and research planning of the complement of the ISS space ex science experiments. Since 2013, she has been the team lead for the Space Application Service Science Team. Hilda is currently using her expertise to guide the users and do business development for the first European commercial ISS platform, IceCubes. I would now like to give the floor to Hilda. Thank you very much, uh, Hazuki. Let me see if I can uh, share. Uh, I think you need to make me presenter, maybe. Thank you. <clears throat> can you confirm you can see my slides full screen? Yes, it looks perfect. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Azuki, um, very much for that kind uh, introduction and also um, to yourself and uh, the UN uh, Office of Outer Space for the informative webinar series and for having me here uh, as a speaker today. Um, you already covered quite a lot of what I have on this slide, actually, ju just to introduce um, what I have been doing. So my name is Hilde Steenart, and as you rightfully mentioned, so I have a background of um, researcher in plasma astrophysics, more specifically in solar magnetohydrodynamics. And after my PhD, I started actually with the company Space Application Services in 1999, and I'm still with them as of today. Um, but I did a number of different functions um, with the company. Um, so I supported the um, automated transfer vehicle operations preparation from uh, Paris um, for uh, then EADS, uh, now Airbus. And after that, I moved back to uh, Brussels um, to coordinate the operations for the science payload of an ISS mission of uh, Belgian astronaut Frank de Wiener. And then I moved to the Netherlands actually initially to do uh, the same function of uh, operations coordination for science payloads on the International Space Station. And then uh, I moved into this function of an ESA mission science office where we did cross-agency coordination of the different research, technology demonstration and educational activities that the different agencies do on the International Space Station. So that gave me uh, a very good opportunity to uh, get insight on all of these different uh, disciplines and type of projects that are being done uh, on the space station. And so, as you mentioned, now I'm s supporting our um, space access service called uh, IceCubes that supports research, technology and educational uh, projects <clears throat> uh, through a partnership with, with ESA, with the European Space Agency. But today uh, we want to talk about technology demonstration under microgravity and hypergravity. And I want to start off with why we are doing this type of technology demonstrations. And then I mean we at large, because that's obviously not just uh, me or we, um, but all of the different um, technology demonstration teams 
Um, so I grouped them here in a number of bullets, and these bullets kind of overlap, but I wanted to make sure that to cover um, different aspects um, with all of these bullets. So the first one is probably the most important. Um, as the name itself says, technology demonstration, we do them to demonstrate or to validate new technologies or new processes, new systems in uh, a true relevant space environment. So without um, risk to crew, spacecraft or mission. And we want to validate these new uh, space technologies that may be used later on in satellites, in spacecraft. Um, and as such, we want to uh, raise what is called technology readiness level, TRL. Uh, and I'll say a bit more on the next slide about uh, what TRL means, because in this context, you may hear that um, quite a lot of, of technology demonstration. People also want to uh, do proof of concepts of operations, training, uh, crew interfaces, logistics, as well as maintainability, reliability. Um, and obtain, uh, and that's very related, operational knowledge in a relevant environment without um, the added cost or the added risks of associating, uh, associated with integrating such a new technology or a new advanced system directly into an operational system. So all of this is part of um, de-risking new uh, innovations, new technologies, and it's, you could also refer to it as in-space engineering uh, research. Um, the two last bullets of these slides are of a bit of a different nature. Um, the first one, um, I mean, the, the one before last, um, some technology demonstration uh, projects are also being done in the scope of capacity building and support of education activities within engineering curricula. And that's also, I think, in this context, uh, relevant. And then the last one is to um, is why we do this is also to um, market creation and, and market development of those uh, new technologies. Um, so I, as I mentioned, I have a couple of um, terminologies, let's say, to, to add a bit more explanation to. The first one is this technology readiness level. And in this picture um, that I show there um, is from the European Space Agency. The different agencies have all their definition, they might be slightly different here and there, but um, in general, um, this TRL is a method that is used to assess the maturity level of a particular uh, technology. So each technology project is evaluated against the parameters for uh, each technology level and is then uh, assigned what is called the TRL rating based on the progress of that uh, project. And so there's nine of these um, technology readiness level. Uh, TRL one, which is on the on the top right, um, is the lowest one, and TRL nine uh, on the bottom left is the highest one. And so, for example, TRL seven requires that um, the working model or a prototype uh, would be demonstrated in a space environment. Um, and so that's then typically why we do this type of technology demonstrations. Um, and once a technology has been flight proven during a successful mission, then eventually it can be called uh, TRL-9. Uh, also related, what you might, might hear a lot are acronyms of IOD, IOV. So it stands for In Orbit Demonstration Validation. And so to be accepted, these new products or new technologies need to be demonstrated in orbit, as, as mentioned, particularly when users require evidence of uh, flight heritage or when there is a high risk associated with their uh, use. And so obtaining this spaceflight heritage in real conditions in a true uh, representative environment is often required to de-risk these innovations of these new technologies and these new products or, or concepts. A proof of concept then is a, is a demonstration to verify that certain uh, concepts or theories have the potential for real world uh, application and it represents the evidence that um, and, and the justification that such a new project, project or, or product um, can use expenses, for example. And then the last one I wanted to have here is commercial of the shelf technology. Uh, and again, you might hear that acronym of COTS, uh, and that refers to hardware and or software that already exists and is available from commercial sources. And so more and more of these COTS components are being used in, in some space mission to achieve high performance. 
but these code components are designed working in a in a terrestrial operating condition and so um, using these uh, components in a spacecraft usually have um, have a much higher reliability and, and suitability requirement because of the nature of, of our space missions. And so also um, the validation of these COTS can uh, be part of, of such technology uh, demonstration. So with that, I covered the first question is why we do technology demonstration. Uh, so let's have a look at what type of uh, technology demonstrations are being done on different uh, space platforms. And I try to group them in a number of categories. Um, and for each of the categories, I listed um, a number of bullets on, on the what and the why for that specific category and a couple of examples. As it goes with examples, they are, of course, by far uh, not exhaustive, but I tried to pick um, some that I thought were interesting and, and representative. And also, I tried to uh, pick more those that are related to uh, as much as possible to microgravity. Um, and also, the, in terms of the categories, I, I concentrated on those that are more impacted by uh, microgravity. So the first category is um, everything related to 3D printing or additive manufacturing or in-space manufacturing, as you want to call it, uh, which is a solution towards uh, sustainable, flexible uh, space missions, both in transit and on the surface of a, of a destination, through on-demand fabrication, on-demand repair, recycling capabilities for critical systems, for habitats, um, and for mission logistics and maintenance. Um, it allows to think in terms of modular architecture, modular infrastructure, and it can also be utilized for what is called in situ resource utilization. So for those maybe not so familiar, that means that we use resources of a certain destination in situ, so on the spot to utilize them uh, or turn them into, into something else. And all of these capabilities can reduce the cost of mission um, by reducing the launch mass and also um, the risk uh, due to decreasing uh, the dependence on spares and on the possibly over-designing uh, systems for, for reliability that is then less uh, needed. Uh, so it also increases the feasibility and the self-sufficiency of uh, these uh, space missions. And once uh, we master those at a larger scale, uh, this will really profoundly way, uh, change the way we actually do space exploration uh, because a significant uh, part of the resources that go into preparing a space mission deals with making sure that it actually survives the trip uh, to orbit. And due to a high uh, number of, for example, moving parts or, or sophisticated components, um, and, and once we will be able to, um, to safely and routinely manufacture those, or at least some of those in space, then that will be a real uh, game changer. And uh, we will be able to reduce um, yeah, cost. We will be able to reduce the amount of testing um, and gradually also put uh, spacecrafts or uh, parts of spacecrafts together in orbit. And so in terms of uh, examples, so the first uh, example on the right, on the top right, um, is called 3D printing in zero G, so very appropriate uh, name. And it was the very first uh, 3D uh, printer that was brought to the International Space Station. And that was uh, done by a company called Made in Space um, through collaboration with, with NASA. And so they demonstrated that a 3D printer can actually work uh, under microgravity condition. Um, as you know, a 3D printer typically extrudes uh, streams of heated plastic or metal or, or an other material to build layer on layer uh, and to create three-dimensional objects. And so to test uh, such a 3D printer uh, using relatively low temperature plastic uh, feedstock on the International Space Station under microgravity was really a first step uh, to show that we can actually um, built uh, in, in the context of manufacturing and maybe uh, in, in, in the road to an on-demand machine shop uh, in space. And the tool you see on the right it was actually one of the first uh, tools that was printed on the International Space Station. Um, they actually transitioned to a second generation that was called Additive Manufacturing Facility. And the one that you see on the bottom is actually a companion of that Additive Manufacturing Facility and it's called the Commercial 
polymer recycling facility. And as the name says, um, it demonstrates actually the, the capability to recycle uh, plastic. Um, so it takes plastic waste um, and it processes that excess material into a uniform uh, feedstock that is suitable then for use in additive manufacturing. And again, it was also uh, done by Made in Space, in this case, uh, through collaboration with a uh, Brazilian entity called uh, Braskem. Um, the second category is around uh, everything related to robotics, tailor robotics, autonomous uh, system. And also here, the link with um, microgravity is important because uh, the robot's motion involves the dynamic response of the system. And in fact, there is no means of replicating the exact dynamic response or behavior of a space robotic uh, system on Earth. Um, and so robotic and telerobotic systems that are operating in and around the spacecraft with or without crew robot, uh, robotic interaction uh, will demonstrate the performance and operational concepts of such uh, robotic uh, systems in, in space environment. Um, also very interesting is the link with artificial intelligence and uh, robotic uh, systems and how it can answer to a lot of space applications or space uh, challenges. Um, also robotics is an area of the space industry that is obviously very driven by technology and is mainly concerned with upstream activities with very little direct downstream benefits to the space industry. But it does have also an excellent potential for what is called spinning and spin-offs. Um, what, what is meant by spinning spin is when you take terrestrial technology from other sectors and you bring them into uh, space um, environment or space technology. Uh, spinning off means technologies that are being developed for uh, a space environment uh, that they could be used in um, non-space sectors on Earth. And in this case, uh, with robotics, uh, you can actually utilize uh, or, or spin off um, some of the technology demonstrations of these robotics into, for example, nuclear decommissioning or healthcare. In fact, there are some uh, robotic arm that has was um, developed for space station of for for which there has been then been spin off to um, uh, robotic surgery, um, but also in deep mining, for example, uh, and others. Um, a last point is is maybe also relevant is that um, space robotics um, is a fantastic topic to also engage with the public and to help uh, stimulate. Uh, activities and young people's interest in, in STEM subjects and especially the combination of robotics with uh, space exploration I think is very uh, very exciting and offers potential also for hands-on activities um, with, with uh, robots. In terms of the uh, examples shown there, um, so the, the first picture on the top is um, ESA astronaut Andre Kuipers that meets uh, Robonaut and you may have heard of Robonaut. He's a uh, humanoid robot that was designed um, with the versatility and the dexterity to actually manipulate hardware and to work in high-risk environments and respond safely to unexpected obstacles. And as you can see, Robonaut uh, consists of a torso with two arms and a head, and he actually has two legs that you can, <laughs> cannot see on the picture. Um, but they have end defectors that allow the robot to translate inside uh, the space station by interfacing with the handrails and the sea tracks. Um, and so there were several generations of Robonaut that were being tested uh, on board the space station. The second example uh, comes from uh, a Japanese space robotics uh, startup company called Jitai. Um, and they collaborate with um, the Japanese Space Agency to perform the world's first technology demonstration of its robots in space by a private sector uh, company. And so, um, and maybe if I click, I can actually get to um, the video at the same time. So they are actually um, showing and testing uh, the use of their robotic arm in the Bishop airlock. So the Bishop airlock is a, a new airlock that was recently installed um, on the International uh, Space Station by a company uh, called Nanorax. <clears throat> and in fact, the uh, video that you see here is from the ground testing of the GTI uh, robotic arm in uh, the ground model of the, the Bishop airlock. 
Um, and so these ground tests were completed successfully. And so still this year, the GTI robotic arms will actually be used in the Bishop airlock on board uh, to demonstrate the ability of the arm to perform various tasks like operating switches or plugging and unplugging cables um, or um, assembling panels, as, as you can see him do actually on, on the video. Um, so it's another nice example, I think, of an uh, interesting um, collaboration of different uh, organizations. Uh, and I should switch off actually uh, the video. So let me get back because otherwise we get noise <laughs> later on. <clears throat> okay, um, next category relates to in-space propulsion and um, the demonstration of um, new technologies of uh, new propulsion systems that might be electric, uh, chemical, hybrid, propellant-less uh, type of propulsion systems. And the demonstration of that is to improve um, spacecraft reliability and lifetime and to reduce the cost of uh, long duration uh, exploration class uh, missions. And so systems for in-space propulsion can actually benefit from in-space demonstration by gaining operational runtime in microgravity or even in a combination of microgravity vacuum and, and thermal environments uh, of, of space, um, while also gaining experience in fuel flow management and, and performance. Um, and such uh, um, in-space propulsion systems can actually be demonstrated, for example, on the space station or on visiting vehicles or on deployed free flyers. It's all also linked to in-space refueling, and I'll come to in-space refueling uh, on the next slide. In terms of um, examples, so the first picture is from Trust Me, and Trust Me is a, a French uh, startup, and they, together with SpaceT, actually launched the first ever iodine-propelled uh, satellite into orbit, and they demonstrated it uh, successfully. And so one of the I mean, or a couple of the advantages of such iodine propelled um, systems is that they can be used in applications where normally uh, pressurized gases are needed. It also allows for cost reduction. Um, you don't have uh, sloshing or uh, the same explosion risk as you would have otherwise. And so less cumbersome launch qualifications uh, would be needed in, in when you use this type of uh, propulsion system. The second one, um, the second picture is from Exotrail, um, and they have uh, launched in November 2020 on board the PSLV rocket. Um, their um, demonstration of their uh, ExoMG Hall Effect uh, electric propulsion system, and they demonstrated it uh, um, positively. And so this allows, um, for example, for um, small satellite constellation, to quickly change their orbit once they're in space. And it can give um, new capabilities for satellite operators in terms of flexibility in their launch strategy or uh, performance increases or also collision avoidance and save the orbiting. And you may know that the whole um, space debris and, and, uh, and space pollution is actually a very hot topic. And so these type of um, new uh, propulsion systems may also help uh, in that context. The next uh, category, as I already mentioned, relates to everything uh, of satellite servicing and uh, refueling. And it covers a wide range of activities um, that can go from fixing or improving or reviving uh, satellites, for example. And it refers to any work to uh, refuel, to repair, to replace or to augment an existing asset in space. Um, and so it allows for uh, satellite life extension, but also uh, it allows for upgradability as the technology evolves uh, on Earth, for example, uh, and then you can upgrade uh, your satellite uh, in orbit by servicing or refueling. Um, and so from extending the lifespan of uh, satellites to assembling, um, for example, massive life-seeking telescopes in space to refueling and repairing uh, spacecraft on their journey uh, to distant locations. So there's a wide uh, range of possibility in this category. And it will also allow to end um, the era of one and done uh, spacecraft. So in the past, a satellite was actually designed to live their life uh, alone. And once it was done, 
uh, it had to be uh, independent. And now through these technologies of servicing and refueling, that might really um, change this whole era and this whole um, uh, paradigm. So key to this is, of course, to demonstrate um, the foundational capabilities also in orbit. Um, and again, also, this is very important in the context of uh, space debris and mitigation and, and reduction, uh, since there are actually plenty of satellites that are in pretty good shape, but they run, for example, out of fuel. Uh, so the, the possibility to refuel them and to prevent them from becoming an inert piece of debris is actually very uh, interesting in this, in this uh, context. And so in terms of uh, pictures, so the upper picture um, is from FURFI. So this is a, a demonstration that was done by OrbitFab. And this is a, a project that um, tested the functionality of a tanker that can refuel uh, spacecraft in orbit from a collapsible fuel tank. And so in this um, demonstration that they did on the inside of the space station, as you can see, they validated actually the, the transfer of fluid from a tanker to this flex tank, so to this com, um, collapsible uh, tank uh, in orbit. And so by doing so, they could raise the technology readiness level from their system from TRL4 uh, to TRL5 by verifying the dynamics and, and testing how it all worked uh, under space conditions. And the second picture is from um, a long-standing program from NASA called Robotic Refueling Missions, and this is from RRM3. Um, and it's actually a combination of robotic tools with uh, refueling, and it uses these robotic tools and, and operations to demonstrate key techniques uh, for transferring uh, cryogenic fluids that are used as, as coolants or propellants or for life support uh, systems in, in orbit. And so it has been quite exciting to see what uh, gradually could be demonstrated as part of this RRM program. Um, the next one, the uh, next category relates to um, communication and navigation. And so also navigation systems can actually be demonstrated, for example, on the inside also of the International Space Station. Uh, you may not expect it, but it's possible. Uh, as you can see on the uh, upper uh, picture or moving image. Um, so there, what is being tested is actually um, part of a program called SPHERES, and it's a long acronym. It stands for Synchronized Position, Hold, Engage, Reorient Experimental Satellites. But in my simple terms, it's these um, mini satellites that are being used uh, on board the space station to test um, a lot of navigation-related uh, algorithms or, or concepts. In this case, um, the program is called Reswarm, and it was meant uh, to validate actually the performance of algorithms that are designed to control swarms of, of uh, small uh, satellites um, <clears throat> under, under long-term uh, microgravity. Um, also, communication systems can actually utilize, um, for example, space station infrastructure to demonstrate uh, delay tolerance and the elim elimination of bottlenecks in space communication architecture, and as, as such allows to, to help to increase the throughput of these integrated uh, communication systems. Um, and so platforms like the space station, but also others can be a testbed for testing uh, deployable antennas um, or to experiment with lowered orbit optical crosslinks or to characterize um, the on-orbit performance of communication systems for um, more expensive advanced uh, communication uh, spacecraft as well. Um, and the picture on the, on the bottom right is from a program called DTN, so Delay or Disruption Tolerant uh, Networking. And that's actually a step towards building a reliable interplanetary uh, internet. So it established a long-term communication testbed on the International Space Station that transmits test messages between the ISS and ground stations. And so these delay and disrupt, disruption tolerant uh, networks can actually improve electronic communications by storing data when a connection is interrupted and then forwarding it to its destination using um, these relay uh, stations. Um, but there's other topics under communication that can also be demonstrated. For example, um, there's also interesting space-based R&D in laser communication that also holds uh, great promise for later 
deep space communication. So it's another area where there's interesting uh, technology demonstration in the context of um, communication. Communication as such is maybe less linked um, to microgravity, um, but I thought it was still nice to uh, have a couple of examples of technology demonstrations related to communication uh, nevertheless. Um, the two next ones are very related also to microgravity. Um, one is on thermal control. The second one that you will see, see on the next slide is related to materials. And in fact, in the for those who, who have been following some of the other webinars, there has been one on fluid science, on material science, very interesting. And as you can imagine, a lot of these technologies um, relate to the research done in these uh, fields. So it's a continuum, of course, from uh, research to uh, technologies. Um, so here, uh, related to thermal control, so there's technologies being tested related to transport or storage um, and refrigeration uh, devices or radiators, insulation, um, and long-term effects of the space environment on, on thermal uh, control components. Also topics related to thermal protection for re-entry um, or spacecraft thermal technologies to maintain cryogenic uh, systems. And so you can imagine that uh, related to these cryogenic systems, so thermal insulation and fluid flow and, and level measurements of these fl fluids are all um, affected by uh, space and microgravity uh, environments. So it's important to test uh, those in uh, a true uh, representative environment. The picture relates to a space test program from NASA. Uh, this one was used in three, and there's actually two payloads on there. Um, the one on the left, MH Tex, um, that investigates um, in space performance of capillary pump loop heat transfer equipment. And then the other uh, Vader that uh, tests variable emissivity radiator and a new form of multi-layer insulation that uses hydrogel. So these are examples of um, technology demonstrations uh, that relate to thermal control uh, that were done uh, a while ago on space station. And so as I mentioned, the next one is related to materials. So as you can imagine, um, during long-term exploration missions, it will be important to use materials that can um, can stand against uh, the harsh environment of, of, of space, so um, that can experience uh, ultraviolet and thermal and uh, energized particle radiation uh, environment on, on that spacecraft. And so, um, again, for example, on the space station or on other platforms, you can actually demonstrate these materials and evaluate um, their long-term uh, exposure in space. Um, also on return vehicles, very interesting to expose uh, sample materials uh, for the return environment. Um, and so these topics also relate to manufacturing in space, which is another very interesting uh, topic being um, demonstrated and researched both on, on the outside uh, space environment and also on, on a pressurized inside space environment. Um, and, and for example, um, well, maybe to say that you can actually um, test the manufacturing of goods uh, in a space environment, in, in possibly also in a vacuum environment that you could not possibly uh, manufacture on Earth. Um, and so the first example, the upper picture is related to uh, optical fiber. Uh, so ZB-LAN, which is a, um, a high quality optical fiber. And so there's uh, a number of companies that started uh, testing and demonstrating the manufacturing of these optical fiber in space under microgravity conditions. Because what you see if you produce them on, on Earth, on that you see that gravity driven forces um, create the formation of impurities. And if you do this under microgravity condition, um, you see that the, these impurities are significantly reduced and the quality uh, of these ZBLAN optical fibers actually is significantly increased. So it's interesting to go and see uh, if that then can lead to an economic um, commercial uh, system, let's say, to produce those uh, and actually manufacture in space to return and use on, on Earth. Um, the second picture relates to carbon nanotubes technology. So these are a lightweight alternative to copper wire and, and other conductive shielding materials. And so these carbon nanotubes are being mixed with um, polymers to create high strength and lightweight uh, composite materials. And so this company Dexmat actually tested uh, their carbon nanotube uh, te technology 
to show that uh, these lighter weight cables um, actually can um, can benefit uh, from from space and that they um, so they collected basically performance data and again to increase uh, TRL, TRL level um, and to show that these type of uh, carbon nanotube um, cables could be um, inserted in satellite systems um, with uh, quite some weight saving uh, compared to their uh, other uh, technologies. Um, next category relates to uh, life support and habitation uh, and environmental technologies. So here um, for long duration exploration, as you know, uh, spacecraft systems must provide for a stable and self-contained uh, microenvironment by re revitalizing the air, by collecting and processing uh, wastewater streams, by providing safe drinking and hygiene water and managing solid waste. And so uh, also, for example, on, on Space Station, uh, you have the opportunity to perform limited upgrades to the, the currently used systems to increase operational availability and to show that we can reduce um, system mass and system resources um, beyond uh, the current capability. And, and the picture shows, um, I mean, Swingbat, and for those that have worked on, on the International Space Station are probably familiar with, I mean, Swingbat, so it's um, a technology that um, is part of the CO2 removal uh, roadmap. So it's an amine-based uh, chemical um, that uh, allows to filter and renew cabin, renew cabin air for uh, breathing. <clears throat> Um, in terms of exploration destination and destination systems, and I group this with uh, platform of the future. So also there, um, space station and other platforms can be used as a test bed to to demonstrate these operational techniques and capabilities, and to demonstrate um, that they can that benefit uh, this. I mean that these capabilities can be developed for uh, human and robotic exploration beyond uh, low Earth orbit. Um, and so the, the upper picture is from a um, uh, technology that was uh, sh demonstrated called LOCAT, LOCAT PTS. So it stands for Lab on a Chip Application Development uh, Portable Test System. And so it was, it's a handheld device, as you see, for rapid detection um, of biological substances on the ISS. Uh, and it was used on the ISS, but also demonstrated uh, for use uh, for uh, supporting scientific activities during human exploration on, on Moon or Mars uh, or otherwise. Um, and I link this also to technologies um, that relate to platforms of the future. Um, and, and the pictures that you see relate to spacecraft on a chip uh, experiment platform. And so that's a, a project that adapts a spacecraft on a chip experimental satellite platform that's called Sprite. Um, to be uh, programmed in, in place and deployed uh, from the International Space Station and providing a low cost and a rapidly deployable uh, small satellite platform that can be used for uh, science, for technology de uh, development, for GPS, for uh, uh, other uh, scopes. And the last um, category uh, relates to um, AR and VR, so artificial uh, augmented uh, reality and virtual reality. Um, so that involves blending the real world with simulated elements. And so um, this technology is, is already used in areas such as flight simulations, but also in surgical training, for example. And more and more of these AR application um, are being used as, as the available computing power grows. Um, the picture that you see uh, on the right is an example of um, a go an AR goggle um, that is shown to be demonstrated uh, to provide assistance uh, to the crew uh, for uh, astronauts' performance um, and accuracy during experiments uh, and otherwise. Actually, on our side, Space Applications, we also worked on uh, technology called WEAR, also based on uh, AR goggles for uh, assistance to the crew um, in space operations. And the other area is artificial intelligence. Um, and yeah, I think the, the, the scope and, and the potential of artificial intelligent technologies is enormous um, and, and very highly relevant to space applications. In fact, we did uh, last year uh, an, an interactive session during the, the IAC uh, together with um, IBM. And IBM actually uh, on artificial intelligence, and IBM are also part of the 
the um, the group around the second picture, which shows Simon, or in this case Simon too. Um, so that was worked by DLR, so the German Space Agency, together with Airbus and IBM. And it's, it's a crew interactive mobile companion, so an astronaut assist, assistant free flying um, technology dem demonstration that can help uh, the crew um, and has a voice control system and it's based on uh, artificial intelligence to uh, support with uh, routine tasks. So a, a nice uh, example of, of technology that was demonstrated. On this slide, I grouped uh, a number of categories that I didn't cover with a, a specific uh, slide, but there's also technologies being tested related to power and energy, to computing. In fact, Hewlett Packard recently uh, launched their spaceborne computer uh, second version, as you may have seen. Um, also science instruments, there's actually quite some um, bio, biotech devices also that are being tested and demonstrated um, for use later on uh, in space. Uh, also related to clothing and textiles and operational processes. And I, I, these ones I didn't cover in more detail because they're less directly related to microgravity, but nevertheless, there's interesting um, technologies being uh, tested as well. Now we covered the why, we covered the what type of technology demonstrations and uh, with examples. Now, how are they being done? Um, so, and I listed here a couple of bullets on who or how um, these are um, processed or, or being operated. So, um, for sure, the agencies have their technology demonstration programs. Um, so, I list here not all of them, but at least some. Uh, uh, so, NASA, ESA, JAXA, um, Canadian, and, and South African, they all have their technology demonstration programs. They all have their solicitations. Um, uh, so NASA has technology demonstration missions and advanced exploration systems. They have a, a solicitation um, where you can propose technologies and, and industry players can propose demonstrations of industry developed uh, space technologies. Uh, also on the European side, there's a TRP, so that's a technology research program that focuses on the lower TRL levels, so TRL 1 to 3. And then there is the general support technology program and that is TRL 4 and up, uh, but there's also, for example, a telecommunication systems program where also technology demonstrations are being done, and similarly for the other uh, agencies. And so these agencies have also um, educational and capacity building programs that also cover technology demonstration, which uh, offer often is also an, a nice entry point for those having ideas uh, for technology demonstration. Also through uh, challenges or uh, competitions. Um, and in fact, um, Yaroslav will be talking about uh, a student-led experiment uh, or technology demonstration that will happen uh, and that was selected through the uh, European Space Agency competition called Orbit Your Thesis. Uh, so that's one example. And I think it's also a very nice um, opportunity for uh, student teams to actually participate to such challenges or competitions. Um, on the US side, there is also the what is called the ISS National Lab that um, also covers technology demonstration. And then there is a range of commercial access services that also allow um, for fast track and direct uh, access for technology demonstrations in space. And I'll, I'll show a couple of examples related to that uh, later on, but it allows actually for uh, any entity to get access um, on a, on a commercial basis. Um, and, and so that means you don't necessarily need to go through the agency processes if, if you choose uh, to go a direct uh, approach. So where can these technology demonstrations uh, related to microgravity or hypergravity being done? Um, so there's a number, a wide, quite a range of, of platforms. And in fact, I summarized um, here the main ones for technology demonstrations. I did not put on purpose a lot of detail here because I also saw that in some of the earlier webinars, some of these platforms were already covered quite well. And there is also next week, I think, also still um, uh, a description of some of these platforms. But just a high level overview. So there's uh, terrestrial based platforms that offer um, a very short term microgravity of, of um, several seconds to, to minutes. Um, so that can be parabolic flights, can be drop towers, um, also uh, that may offer 
uh, lower quality, but still uh, relevant microgravity, for example, on, on uh, uh, sailplanes or gliders, uh, or even neutral buoyancy, where there's um, testing being done of, of technologies related uh, to, to um, EVA, so the, um, the, the, the spacewalks outside. Uh, you can also test um, and demonstrate technologies in suborbital flight. So these are uh, flights uh, when a spacecraft goes into space but does not reach the altitude where it can actually orbit uh, the Earth, uh, hence the name. Uh, so also there, there's sounding rockets um, that can be uh, used, or, or even balloons actually, where some uh, microgravity-related uh, testing is, is happening. Um, and then there is the ISS. Um, so ISS offers uh, long duration uh, microgravity uh, and high quality uh, relation, uh, high quality uh, microgravity. Uh, and so it allows to demonstrate technologies both uh, internal, so in the pressurized uh, side of the, uh, um, of the space station, but also external. Um, and I'll show some of the platforms related to that. And also uh, I mentioned before this, uh, the Bishop airlocks that are couple of airlocks that can also be used for technology um, demonstrations. Um, then there's also CubeSats being used uh, for technology demonstration, both um, hosted on CubeSat platforms or deployed uh, to be operated by themselves or um, <clears throat> through ride shares. So um, taking a, a ride on uh, a spacecraft uh, to get into space. And then there's also some um, spacecraft uh, platforms that are actually serving as technology demonstration platform as a whole for more experiments. And there's, for example, NASA has run an, um, a mission that, that's called OSAM, so on-orbit servicing assembly and manufacturing, that hosted a number of technology demonstrations all together on one platform uh, mission. Now, to decide uh, on which platform to go, um, I borrowed this very nice table that um, Mr. Boggs and Mr. Diri from Telespazio made as part of a paper um, that they did, which I thought was a good summary of um, the different user needs and different categories of criteria uh, that may drive uh, you as a technology demonstrator in choosing one or the other platform. Um, so I mentioned already that the duration of microgravity um, is probably an important factor, um, but also the quality of micro microgravity might be relevant, uh, how much payload they can accommodate uh, on that platform in terms of mass, volume, um, but also if you need for your technology demonstrator human interaction or not, if you need uh, real-time uh, data, uh, so command and control, um, how frequently uh, you can access that platform. So these are all criteria that may drive you to one or the other uh, platform. And for sure, if you have questions or doubts about that, you can reach out to, to uh, myself or others, also the gentleman that made this table, um, to, to help you in identifying what is the better platform uh, for your technology demonstration. So still on the where, so I said I would show a couple of um, uh, possibilities on where you can actually do technology demonstration. So I men mentioned earlier this Bishop Air airlock already, um, but also there's external platforms like the one from uh, Bartolomeo, uh, UN USA, uh, people are well aware, so from Airbus um, that was uh, launched, I think, last year. Um, but there's also the ICEP external platform that is exploited by the Japanese company SpaceBD um, that you can access. Uh, also very interesting for material um, samples exposure is the MISI platform that you see here that is uh, run by a company in the US called Alpha Space and it takes um, all of these different little samples and exposes it to the outside, so very nice. Um, and then there's this SPHERE uh, program um, that I mentioned earlier, so that's a long-standing program uh, from NASA in collaboration with MIT. Um, they now uh, are at a new generation of AstroB, and in fact, they have uh, what they call a uh, guest scientist program, so that also uh, other parties can actually propose uh, testing with, with those uh, spheres or AstroB um, uh, mini satellites. Uh, in terms of CubeSats technology demonstrations, so there, there's uh, hosted platforms like the one from InSpace Missions, uh, the Faraday platform, or you can have different type of deployers of CubeSat. Here I show the one from ExoLaunch, but again, uh, as the risk go with examples, you, I could have picked many others. Uh, again, these are just examples of platforms, example of um, some of these commercial 
access services that you can also approach or, or contact if you want to do uh, technology demonstrations. But again, they're by far not exhaustive and I could have picked other ones. Um, one other example of a platform is the one that we run ourselves. So it's, it's called ICE Cubes. It stands for International Commercial Experiment Cubes. So it's a facility on the inside of the space station. And so we provide regular access um, and fast track access for these different type of cubes that can all contain different uh, technologies uh, to, to, to be demonstrated either inside of this facility where you see these blue uh, boxes, uh, they are connected with their connectors and then they can run or you can command them through our uh, real-time interaction over uh, internet, so via IP protocols from wherever you want. Um, but we also have um, a, a connector on the front side, which allows you, you also to have um, a payload in the aisle, so in, in the corridor, let's say, of the module of the, of the space station. Um, and so if you need, for example, uh, interaction of, of the crew or it doesn't fit uh, in terms of volume, you can also use uh, an aisle payload. And we also have the capability of Wi-Fi uh, payloads, so uh, payloads that are actually uh, through Wi-Fi in contact with, with the facility. And so that allows to test um, some cases that I show here on the right um, of wireless controlled experiments, for example, in the in the sense of guidance and navigation algorithms um, uh, to, you, to test technologies in, in formation flying or collision avoidance or these miniaturized docking or berthing uh, subsystems that um, maybe want to be demonstrated. Uh, on the left, some use cases that can be tested in a platform as ours on the inside uh, of the space station, so related to um, some of the topics I mentioned uh, already, like material manufacturing, but also heat pipes, uh, sloshing demonstrations or robotic systems that can all uh, be tested also in the pressurized um, platforms that are on the space station. And just to end with a couple of example cases of technology demonstrations that we have supported uh, through our IceCube service. So one um, was done for ESA on, on cybersecurity. So it tested technological solutions to make encryption-based secure communication feasible for um, space missions, and so they basically hacked their own cubes from the ground uh, to test uh, their cyber security. Um, the second example is, is something completely different, so it was a spectrometer in, in UV uh, and, and, and visible um, that was uh, demonstrated on orbit as a precursor for future uh, exobiology uh, missions. So the, the spectrometer was developed by German company uh, OHB uh, and so it was demonstrated uh, on the ISS in our, in our platform. And the last example is uh, a diamond-based magnetometer, and Yaroslav is, is here, he will present actually uh, as part of the student talks. Uh, so that's one that we will be launching uh, quite soon uh, because it's very ready. So just to conclude on um, technology demonstrations under uh, microgravity and hypergravity, so I try to cover why we do this, to validate it in a true space environment is, is our main uh, reason, and then to raise these TRL uh, levels. Um, I try to cover what uh, types there are, what the scopes are of these different categories, technology demonstration, and, and cover quite some use cases with examples. Um, and in terms of the how, so there's different routes. Uh, if you have ideas on technology demonstration, um, there's different opportunities in terms of challenges, competitions, um, through agencies, through uh, commercial services. Um, my main message would be, if you have an idea uh, of, of a technology demonstration, go out and network, talk to people. Um, you can reach out to me, but there's many other uh, people also in previous webinars. Um, and, and see, um, I mean, what they can recommend you in terms, in terms of access, in terms of routes. Um, and in terms of platforms to be used for your uh, scope. And, and look for collaborations, uh, especially when your student teams, for example, collaborations with, with a company or, or uh, other institutes can really help you uh, to bring your technologies uh, into space. And so with that, I uh, close my uh, talk by thanking you. And I think I'll wait for the questions uh, until after the next talks. Back to you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Hilda, for this amazing presentation. It really covered everything from why, what, who, how, and where. Through the whys, we were able to learn why well, why we actually um, do technology demonstration in space. Um, and we learned about TRLs as well. It, it was a great presentation. We really learned um, the different um, levels of technology and also um, it was really interesting to see what can be done so I can't give a list here but um, there's a, an amazing a list of things that you can do there and also um, to know who's doing and how they're doing it is also um, great information for everyone so thank you so much for this really inspiring and really organized presentation. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next I'd like to move on to our two student speakers. So first I'd like to bring Alvaro on the floor. Um, People who joined in last week may know him, so I'm gonna give a shorter um, introduction for him. So Alvaro is a PhD student in the Aerospace Engineering Science Engineering Sciences at the University of Colorado Boulder, and he is the current president-elect of the ASGSR Student Society. So I'm gonna give the floor to you now, Alvaro. Um, I hope you Thanks can. Thanks very much. Yep. Let me share my screen. Uh, okay, here we go. Yeah, you see great. So thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, as I said last, last week, after these professional presentations, it is kind of hard to, <laughs> to present the student projects because they are so great. So I, I will do my best. The thing is that uh, my name is Alvaro. I'm a PhD student at Sea Boulder, and I want to talk today from a more engineering or design perspective about uh, one of the projects that I briefly mentioned last week. First of all, I, I want to give you a short introduction about myself. I do a PhD in the Aerospace Engineering Sciences uh, Department of CU Boulder, and my, the focus of my research is low gravity magneto hydrodynamics. In other words, I study the intersection between low gravity fluid mechanics and magnetism, among other, th other things. And uh, as Katsuki says, uh, I'm also president elect of ASCSR uh, students. So if, if you are interested in micro gravity research and you are in the US or even not, because we have have international members, please reach out to me and uh, join our society because uh, there is a lot going on there about, uh, about this field. Just for the record, uh, I studied in the University of Seville and then moved to my master's in space engineering at Politecnico de Milano. But really, the, the tilting point that made me focus on micro research came from an opportunity offered by the European Space Agency and the European Low Gravity Research Association which was the first Isa Egra Summer School of Microwave Research in Redu, Belgium. Another 30 colleagues of mine attended this workshop, and here I really discovered that this was what I wanted to do. So supporting the previous speaking com comments, if you really want to get into this world, you must join your, your local communities and take advantage of these amazing opportunities that you will find around the globe. And uh, since I really spoke about myself too much now and in the, in the last uh, webinar, I will jump directly into research. I want to do it from a different perspective with respect to last week. So as Hilde has said already, when we design a space system, we go from low, low TRL to high TRL. And the idea of this, it is basically a very conservative approach. In a space, you don't want to test the most brilliant idea or the latest microprocessor in, in your uh, spacecraft because that is the best way to commit mistakes and, and lead to mission failure. So we go step by step. Actually, the space engineering industry is extremely conservative against popular belief. So when we talk about the, about the technological demonstrator, uh, we talk about a TRL-7 technology, that is something that has been proved, that has been formulated, that has been tested in the laboratory, and that has been built with a kind of uh, technology, uh, final technological configuration to be flown in a space. So I want to tell you, I, in this framework, I want to present uh, one of our projects that is related to low gravity uh, electrolysis. As you know, Electrolysis is one of the fundamental technologies in space applications, and the reason for that is that water is a very uh, a high density uh, material from which you can extract hydrogen and oxygen. The first can be used in uh, propulsion systems, and the second in life support systems, among many other applications. So the idea is that you can get water, for instance, from, from the moon, from the non-illuminated craters, or through in-situ resources of utilization of asteroids, Mars, and other places, and uh, get that water and use it to produce propellant and uh, life support systems. But the problem of electrolysis, at least of 
uh, alkaline electrolysis and proton exchange membrane electrolysis is that in order to get those gases, you need to work with multiphase flows. And the problem of multiphase flows in microgravity is that the absence of buoyancy leads to the mixing of the, of the gas and liquid. And that produces these layers that you can see here in the picture uh, over the surfaces of your electrodes of your electrolytic salt. In order to get rid of these layers and extract the gas and improve the efficiency of the system, you need a series of pumps and uh, control mechanisms that consume mass, power, and basically are far from optimal from the purely engineering perspective. And there are many technologies to do this. Uh, you can, can find rotary devices, membranes. You can even spin your whole spacecraft, as uh, Doyle and Peck proposed in this paper that I leave uh, at the bottom of the of the uh, screen. Or you can even could even use a uh, surface tension by means of conduit geometries, as you can see at the right. But none of this system is perfect. Is perfect. Uh, every one of them has its disadvantages and uh, its uh, advantages. So. What we came up with was the with a different idea. And in order to introduce this different idea, I want to, to show this very funny video of uh, a levitating frog on Earth. As you know, um, biological systems like frogs or humans or plants or whatever you can imagine are mostly made of water, and water is a diamagnetic material. This means that if you assert a strong magnetic force with a a strong gradient on, on these systems, they will experience a strong uh, diamagnetic force on them. And this strong diamagnetic force can be observed only with very strong magnets on Earth, because in gravity is masking everything you can do on Earth. But in a space, this force suddenly becomes very significant. So the idea that my colleagues and I had was, uh, OK, let's um, let's use modern endymion magnets that are high density to induce phase separation in microgravity and extract the bubbles from the surface of the electrodes so we don't have uh, that accumulation that I showed before. And the rationale behind this uh, is basically uh, that you are kind of generating a gravity equivalent force in a space by means of magnets, which is pretty fun. So the two more um, basic, the two more um, really, uh, yes, the, the two really technologies that we can study nowadays are the two that I have uh, highlighted here in red. The magnetic electrolysis and conveying phase separation. We'll talk about this a bit later. But first, I want to uh, show you what has been done in the field because uh, there's previous experiments. I mean, the physical concept is very well known. This is not a fundamental microgravity science uh, project. This is a, something that we are designing to focus on technology. And indeed, you can find papers in the past where other researchers have, te have tested the effects of magnetic fields on multiphase flows in microgravity, like for instance, for instance, this from Wakayama, uh, where he basically takes a set of bubbles and immerses it in, in a multiphase flow with madness, and he observes the movement of the bubbles subject to this strong magnetic force. And as you can see in the picture, the bubbles end up uh, coalescing together. So the concept, what I mean here is that the concept of the magnetic force uh, in a space, uh, its uh, application has been studied before. We are not inventing anything new. It, it is, this is not a physics project. What is new is the application. And indeed, uh, in the, our project, what we have done, first of all, is uh, an analytical study. So we took a, a standard magnet that so you can buy nowadays very cheaply, and we have uh, analyzed what kind of force can those magnets induce in when gas bubbles in water. As you can see, uh, the terminal velocities that we can achieve in a space have, are of the order of 0 0.1 to 10 millimeters per second. And that may seem very small, but in a space, again, due to the absence of gravity, this is a very large uh, flux, a very large flux that can be employed, theoretically speaking, in a technology. Even if this seems uh, to be very, um, a very, seems to be a very weak force. Oh, the video is not working. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You have here the link. Even if this seems to be a very weak force, that it turns out that you can find videos like this one that I can reproduce for some reason uh, at the International uh, Space Station, where you can see rotating bubbles and rotating multiphase systems, and you can see that much weaker forces of the order of five or to times ten to the minus four meters per second square can induce significant phase separation. So, what I mean with this is that our system hopefully should work. And in order to test it, we uh, presented and got. Uh, uh, accepted a, a proposal for the SDS Arkansas program 2020. And the idea of this uh, experiment is to launch a payload, a Blue Origins new Cephar. 
And the requirements uh, here, I want to focus more on the engineering side of the project because I know that many engineers are attending this webinar. The payload requirements here are kind of tricky because this is publicly available, by the way, that the thing is that we can only use 150 milliliters of non hazardous liquid. We can um, we have only have two units of volume for our experiment, half a kilogram and 4.5 4.5 watts of power. And there are many other um, restrictions here. This is common. If you are a student and you want to do microbiology research, you will always find that the facility imposes some requirements on your design. These are the main requirements that we have to face from our payload perspective, and other facilities will, will present other, other types of them. The second step that you take is, okay, we have this list of requirements. In our case, it's about 200 requirements. Here, for instance, at the left, I showed you the level one requirements that you will find uh, in, in our publications and in our papers. And these are very basic ones, like we want uh, the, the magnetic field to detach the bubbles, or we want to observe the bubbles moving under the influence of the magnetic field, or the missions to test the magnetically enhanced, enhanced uh, liquid gas separation with conduit geometries. These are basically hey, basic high level requirements that you need to satisfy and then from this level one requirements you get the level two requirements which are much more detailed and subdivided by subsystem so with this list of with this shopping list you start designing but you don't start designing uh, in in your uh, CAD assistance model you basically run a series of architectures and you, you uh, select the architecture that works best for you once you have that architecture, which is basically a smaller shopping list, you draw by hand a preliminary design. And here in this phase, you don't need to use CAD software. A, an iPad with a, with a pen or, or, a, or a sheet of paper will work <laughs> perfectly for this. And the idea of this preliminary design that should look something some, somehow like this is to um, basically to, to place the main components of the cell. For instance, here we wanted to test phase separation and electrolysis. So we placed an electrolytic cell, a series of magnets and gas accumulators, electronics, USB, more or less what everything, um, what, where everything was located. And then in the final step, you start iterating this design until you reach something like this, which is a much more detailed design where you know how, what to do and how to do it. And in this case, what we have is uh, two electrolytic cells, a magnetic one and a non-magnetic one. And in the magnetic system, the bubbles should detach from the surface of the proton and semi membranes and follow a certain circuit that I represent here. So the bubbles should come here, exit these uh, channels over here, go to these triangular structures to induce phase separation, and all of that subject to a strong edimium magnet that, uh, magnet that is placed here in these square boxes. So this is our design. We will generate bubbles at the surface. Well, these bubbles will be attracted and we will induce phase separation and we will detach the bubbles from the surface according to our calculations. And this is representative of the final system that they would like to build in a space. An interesting thing that you will also have to do in your experiments, particularly if you work in fluid mechanics, is that you will always have to place a contrast uh, system that uh, with which you can compare. So for instance, here we have the magnetic cell uh, and the magnetic cell will work in, in microwave conditions in one way or another. But at the bottom of the system, we have a non-magnetic cell that is located far away enough from the magnet such that it is, um, so it is uh, subject to pure microwave conditions. And the purpose of this cell here is to say, okay, we have this magnetic system and we have this non-magnetic system, and this is the comparison. One works in this way and the other ones because of the magnets works in that way. The idea of this, again, is not to demonstrate a physical concept. It is to demonstrate a technology. And, and that's why we call this a technological demonstrator and not, and not a fluid mechanics or pure physics experiment. So to conclude, I want to give a few remarks on what do you want to do, what, what do you need to do to, to get involved in microarray research? So the first question that you have to ask yourselves, not only for this, but for many other things is, who are you and what do you want to do? And this is important because the microarray research community is not only useful for freaks like me that love uh, launching rockets and launching experiments at drop towers and parabolic flights and et cetera. It is also a way to uh, enhance your technical background and capabilities. Most of my colleagues in my past uh, experiments didn't end up in the microarray research community. They ended up in, a space in the space community or just in engineering companies. 
but the experience that they got from this uh, set of projects was extremely invaluable for them. Once you know what you what you do you want to do, you should make a plan. And the best way to make this plan succeed is to join, in, in case you want to devote yourself to microarray research, is to join the microarray research community. And there are many organizations that you should take into account. You know sir, that it's hosting this webinar is one of them, but SDSR is in the US, Elgrand, Selgrand, and in Europe, and just find Japan. And there are many others. So just join your community because you will have many more opportunities and you will learn from your peers. Look for hands-on opportunities. Don't restrict yourself to webinars. You really need to be there uh, working with your hands in, in your microarray project and team up. Even if when you uh, work in, in, in more advanced research projects, you need to team up with different researchers. Uh, and most, most of the times, these different researchers are from everywhere around the world. And most importantly, and to conclude this, have fun. <laughs> this is the most important part of this, because if you don't have fun with this, it is not worth it. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out here and to check our newly published paper at the Journal of Space Crab and Rockets that is uh, right now um, waiting to be published but accepted for publication. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alvaro. Thank, so really Thank you so much for so um, giving us an overview of your experience. Your experience. Alone, and especially for giving us advice on reaching out to many different, many different, 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 different. Um, uh, The first webinar we did in this series is actually um, really introducing um, Elgra, ASGSR, and JASMA. Uh, so um, if you're interested in joining um, any of these associations, associations and um, please um, check out our first webinar because we have um, introductions from them. Thank you so much Alvaro. Thanks to you for the invitation. Okay so our next speaker is Yaroslav. I'm going to introduce him to the floor. Um, Yaroslav is a PhD student of physics working in the quantum Photonics Lab under the supervision of Professor Milos Nesledek at Hasselt University. Um, he has a master's degree in biomedical engineering from Czech Technical University in Prague. Um, he is originally from Czech Republic and currently leading an interdisciplinary team of 15 students within the Oscar Q project, which I saw he was wearing a t-shirt of. Maybe he'll show us later. Okay, I'm going to give the floor to Yaroslav now. Thank you very much, Hazuki, for, for your nice introduction. Hello everyone, dear audience, it is an honor to be here and we are super grateful for this opportunity. The Oscar journey began back in 2014 when we were hunting Aurora Borealis in the north of Sweden. During this expedition, we had the opportunity to visit Estrain Space Center in Kiruna. This was actually the very first time when we learned about the microgravity educational programs of European Space Agency. When we were standing there in the dark cold nothingness of the polar region, we were detecting the weak magnetic field fluctuations caused by Aurora Borealis, but the classical magnetometry system performance back then was comparable to this image. It was lacking in sensitivity, having poor dynamic range, and suffering from long-term instabilities and other thermal drifts. But what if I tell you that in our lab we are developing a novel type of technology that can bring you performance more like this, with the excellent sensitivity down to femtotesla. The very wide dynamic range, ranging from femtotesla to millitesla while still being linear, complete thermal independence and other benefits originating from its quantum nature. We are bringing you today a novel magnetometry technology which is based on diamond and quantum operating principle. We are a project Oscar Cube, optical sensors based on carbon materials. My name is Yarda, I'm the team leader of this student project and today I will show you how our technology works. But before we start, let's answer the question, why magnetometry? Well, magnetometry has a wide number of application potential. It, it ranges from the navigation through the mineral and oil exploration, also to the biomedical technologies where, for example, the electricity, wh wherever there is electricity, there is also magnetic field. So we can use it in detection of, for example, brain waves or other, other signals within the human body. But for us, it is very in interesting also for the space exploration and we can use it, for example, to understand the, the planets, our solar system and so on. But also we can use it for detection of the space weather, which can have impact on the communication or other terrestrial systems. Also, our technology can be the stepping stone for the more advanced quantum technologies, which are based on diamond. So what is so unique about this diamond? First of all, everybody knows that it's very robust, stable and radiation hard material, which can withstand wide range of temperatures, pressures 
and so on. But it can also contain in its crystalline lattice defects, which, for example, for us, the most important one is the nitrogen vacancy center, which is also so-called NV center, which can be used as a magnetic probe with excellent sensitivity, very wide dynamic range, and fast response to the changes in the magnetic field. Also, because it, it can be oriented in, along four different orientations of the along the crystallographic axis of the diamond, it can be used for vector magnetometry. So how does it actually work? So we have the NV center, the electron of the NV center in the ground state. When we apply green light to it, we can excite it from the ground state to the excited state. When it relaxes back to the ground state, it uh, releases energy in form of red photon. If we observe this red light in time, we actually will notice that it's very stable in time and resistant to photo bleaching. Then in next step, if we apply microwave frequency to the system, actually the plus minus one spin states of the, of the electron get a little bit more of energy and then they can decay through the metastable states. If they decay this way, the transition is non-luminescent. Therefore, if we, if we plot the red light intensity as function of frequency, we observe drop in the luminescence where the frequency is resonant. Then, because I said there is plus minus one spin states, if we apply external magnetic field, we actually split these two plus minus one states apart. This effect is so-called Zeeman splitting. And then, if we plot the, the intensity as function of frequency, we will observe two drops in the in the intensity. And then the delta F of, of these two frequency, of these two drops, is actually directly proportional to the magnetic field that we apply. And this is how it works. So the Oscar cube has three main mission objectives. Those are technical, scientific, and the personal growth. The technical is to develop the diamond quantum magnetometer suitable for space applications. Then the scientific is to demonstrate and use this device to map the magnetic fields of the Earth and also on board of the station. And then, because we are a student project, it is very important to stimulate the growth of the students and to enable them to step into the fields of quantum and space research. So to achieve those goals, you actually need a team. We are a team of 15 mostly undergraduate interdisciplinary students. We are covering faculties of electronics, software, mechanical engineering, as well as physics all the important disciplines needed within this project. And this, what is very important is that this project is done within the framework of Orbit Your Thesis program of European Space Agency. This, this program allows to the students to experience the full life cycle of the space project. We actually started from the idea forming, went through the selection workshop back in last, last year in, in April. Uh, we, we are designing, we were able to design our system to prototype everything. We were going through the safety reviews, test campaigns and launch preparations very recently. And as well, the Orbit Your Thesis program provides the, the launch opportunity and also they provide together with space application services, the accommodation of the experiment on board the ISS in, inside of the ice cubes facility. So the main core value of what, what, this, what this program provides is the expert panel insight into the project development. It facilitates the environmental testing and ensures the safety criteria are met and the project is allowed on board the ISS. As well as all this severely boosts the team and the students participating by giving them all the valuable experience and hands-on that is there. So we are currently here. We are fully tested and we have passed all the reviews and we are waiting to be launched on 18th of August on board the SpaceX CRS-23. So why is it so unique? Why, why the Orbit Your Thesis program is so unique? It provides not only the launch opportunity, but also the housing on board the ISS, which is inside the IceCube's facility, which gives the power and Ethernet to the, to the experiment. So you no longer need to care about those things. So this was actually the main criteria why we went for Orbit Your Thesis instead of other platforms, because like this, we can spend all the resources like time and money and so on on the core mission objectives while not worrying about the other technical aspects such as power management, communications, you name it. Like it, it would be, for example, um, if we would go for CubeSub or stuff. 
you can probably imagine the quantum stuff is challenging on its own, even without these distractions. So we are super happy to be part of this project. So to slowly sum up, where are we today? We developed fully functional device that passed all the necessary tests and the requirements to fly and operate on board the ISS. We achieved the measure, measurement rate, which if we recalculate, um, corresponds to about six meters of ISS trajectory. So we can sample with very fine, very fine resolution. Um, while the practical sensitivity is maybe not yet reaching the highest potential of this technology, we however managed to shrink it into a unit of one liter with some room to spare as well. And however challenging, we fully developed our experiment within, within one year. And thanks to this program, we learned a lot and now we can take it even, even further. And as I said, the, this entire venture would not be possible without the support and endorsement of our university and our institute. European Space Agency organizing the Orbiter thesis program that we are part of, providing us with all the opportunity to launch our experiment to the ISS, as well as providing all the technical and educational support. Also, we are super grateful for the space application services who provided us with the housing for, for our cube in the ice cubes facility. And we also have to mention our supporters because the European Space Agency only brings us up, but Thanks to our supporters, we managed to secure the, the funding to also retrieve the cube back from, from the orbit. So this way we can inspire next generations of students by having it within the university and so on. And if you would like to know more about our journey, you can always follow us on our social media and get inspired to dream big and aim high because we believe that this technology, that the technology does not automatically improve. It only improves when motivated people work hard to make it better. So let's work together and change the way the magnetometry is done today. We are Oscar Cube. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yasla, for this really interesting presentation about Oscar Cube. Um, it's a really great sample of technology demonstration in space. We really look forward to, to the launch and to the actual experiment. Please let us know what happens. Thank you. OK, thank you so much to all the speakers. Now I'd like to move on to the Q&A. So if you have any questions to all the speakers, please um, start shooting them now. I see a few already, so um, we will start with the questions. So um, the first question was already answered in the chat, but I'd like to mention again, um, drop test um, is open to um, research institute universities and other public organizations that are um, member states of the United Nations. So drop test is um, relatively open to everyone. Um, if you're interested, please make sure to check um, the announcement of opportunity out. Um, I would say drop test is very, um, uh, open. Um, we have different programs with different um, eligibility criteria, but drop test is relatively big, so please make sure to check that out. Um, okay, and the second question is from Carlos. Um, he is asking about where can we read about nanotechnology in space? Any suggestions? So maybe I can ask all speakers um, if you have any suggestions, any websites, any books, any, any material that um, um, we can get information about nanotechnology. That would be great. So I'll give the floor to Hilda first. Okay. Um, yeah, I think nanotechnologies in space is uh, super interesting. There's obviously a lot of um, applications in terms of nanomaterials, such as graphene, uh, radiation shielding, uh, also for instruments and so on. Uh, for, um, I mean, by using uh, some of these nanomaterials and nanotechnologies. I think, um, I mean, if, if there's quite some um, information accessible just on the internet, I think um, there's actually a website that I saw related to nanotechnologies uh, in space. Um, I could also recommend maybe um, the website from the ISS National Lab. And if you go there to their uh, research portfolio and then uh, you, you search for nano or nanotechnology, you will also find um, quite some interesting ones um, there uh, that I think you might be interested to read about. So these are maybe my uh, hints in that sense. Thank you so much, Hilda. Um, Alvaro, do you have any um, information to add to this? 
Yes, um, th there are two ways uh, for me. In my opinion, there are two main tracks you can use to get uh, information. If you are a scientist, journals are, are the best source of, of it always. Uh, what I do is is I have a, I, I use Google Scholar to click the researches I like, and, and Google Scholar sends me automatically their new research. So I'm, I'm always up to date, and you learn a lot. I, I, as a research, I reserve always maybe 20% of my time to read new papers. So that, that's the way to go if you want to, to do research. But then there are others, um, other media that may be better if, if you are just a student, undergrad student, master student. For instance, there are many publications like the Space Review uh, that uh, makes uh, some very, very nice articles about uh, space technology. Or uh, it, he previously said the ISS National Lab. Uh, for instance, in Europe, you had the Erasmus Experiment Archive with all the experiments performed by ISS students. And there are, <laughs> there are a thousand um, platforms that you can use for that in, in a more general way. Of course, you can always dig uh, a bit more into that, but those are my two recommendations. General public, there are many journals out there and articles, scientific articles, uh, publishing that you can get from uh, Google Scholar and similar uh, platforms. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Jaroslav, do you have anything to add to the two speakers? No, not, not really. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I also see uh, in the chat that um, one of our guests had put on a, a link as well. So um, uh, Carlos, if you're interested, please make sure to check that out. OK, the second question is from Michael. Um, he's um, this is addressed to Hilda. So um, you showed various opportunities for on-orbit demonstrations and even lab and flight options that included civil space agencies. So are there any considerations or restrictions to be aware of for non-domestic entities using the civil space agency facilities? So do you have any advice for this situation? Um, yeah, and I, I would would uh, invite uh, Michael maybe for <laughs> chat also later on, but I think um, for it depends also um, which entity he's thinking of when he says non-domestic, which which type of entity, um, if it's uh, academic, if it's another agency, if it's a, a company, um, it depends. But um, what I can say is that some of the space agencies have actually started to open up their um, facilities, for example, on the International Space Station for other uh, others utilization so they have opened them up for exploitation for example JAXA has been doing that the Japanese space agency with some of their uh, both external and internal uh, facilities that they are now being exploited by a service a commercial service provider for the utilization of anybody um, so I think that's um, I mean an, an, an interesting uh, approach that some of the space agencies have taken to allow for access to their facility by uh, others. Um, I think also there are some uh, entities that or uh, other nations or uh, agencies that have set up uh, specific collaborations with uh, some of the civil agencies, uh, sp space agencies that I mentioned. And that's another way um, that they can get get uh, access to utilization of these uh, facilities. And then I think um, in general, some of the uh, the commercial services like ours or, or like some of, of the ones that I mentioned also offer uh, global access actually to facilities that are existing, uh, for example, also on, on the space station. So I think there's quite some possibilities to for uh, non-domestic entities, as you called it, to access uh, facilities that are on board and that um, may belong to one or the other uh, space agency. But I, I, I do invite um, Michael to, for further discussion where uh, I can help maybe more in, in specific directions if that's helpful to him. Thank you so much, Hilda. I think that was very clear. We have another question from Michael, actually. Um, you made a very good point about the cost benefit of testing the fiber and CNTs. So given that more and more, um, more and more of these demonstrations are commercial based, what do you think is the biggest cost barrier to conducting on orbit demonstrations? How can these barriers be addressed? OK, um, and I'm not fully sure why uh, Michael refers to cost barrier. So I think when when people want to demonstrate, for example, 
um, the fiber technologies or these carbon nanotubes. The first step is obviously to demonstrate and validate them uh, in, a, in a true space environment. I think that can be done uh, through, I mean, some of the ways that, that I mentioned earlier, whether that's competition challenges through agencies uh, or through uh, collaborations maybe with, with uh, companies. But that's, let's say, the first step. I don't think that's the highest barrier. Um, you also need to show them if, if it's indeed a commercial approach, you need to show obviously the economic case and the business plan that comes with that. That's uh, a challenge, I would say. Um, but I think the biggest barrier for those is yet to come. Uh, and that's um, when these cases have shown that it's relevant to do this type of manufacturing in space and they want to go and scale up. Um, and that I think will, will be the, the, the biggest barrier. Um, there, I think, uh, maybe even uh, scaling up on, on ISS for some of these manufacturing will not, will not be possible for all of, the, all of the cases. And then we might need to look at, at uh, other uh, platforms. I think there's quite some uh, new platforms also in the making that may allow uh, for some of these manufacturing uh, scale-ups. Uh, and to address those barriers, I think, yeah, I think it's important that um, fast track approaches um, are, are being used, collaborations are set up. Um, and I think also a lot has been done in the setup of, of commercial um, direct services uh, in terms of streamlining some of these uh, processes related to, and, and removing some of these barriers. I think um, that I think is one of the of the importance of this commercial ecosystem that has been uh, created or that is in it being created i should say i don't know if that fully answers the question but these are my thoughts uh when when i i read the question let's see thank you so much hilda i think that was clear as well um i'd like to move on to the next question um for Yarl, for yaroslav um, you have you may have mentioned this, and I and he, I, may, I might have missed it. But what are other materials that you considered in addition to diamonds? Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm not sure if I fully understand what what you mean by all the 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 other materials. So you mean different different technologies, or uh, why did we choose the the diamond? So the the unique thing about the the diamond and about the NV magnetometry is actually that you can use it in the room temperature. So it's it's actually quantum technology that can use in that can be used in the room temperature, which is great benefit. And second thing is that it it has both combination of the very wide dynamic range, so it can it can measure in from femtotesla up to up to millitesla while still being being linear. That's that's the main that's the main thing. And also it can reach those um, those high sensitivities. Also another benefit is that the NV center is is basically like small molecules like two atom big within within some some diamond around it. So you can miniaturize it a lot. And also you can use it in different kind of applications that where you can use, for example, diamond nanoparticles in different different technologies and increase that way the spatial resolution. So create some kind of magnetic cameras for the nanoscale imaging, etc. Okay, thank you so much. I saw that Michael wrote that it's about technology, uh, other technologies. So I think Yaroslav was on point there. Okay, yeah. another question I see, and I, I guess this is for Yaroslav as well from Madhavan, is the five W, no, the five W required is battery for uh, battery or solar panels for the student community. Yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, Yaroslav, maybe do you see the question in the chat from Madhavan? I, I will repeat what he wrote. It says the 5W required is battery or solar panels for the student community. I am, so so the 5 watts that is required to operate this is provided by the ice cubes facility. And that, that's actually why we were not constrained by the by the power that much. The maximum limit was actually 10, 10 watts, which is provided by the by the ICF. So that's, that's actually the reason why we went for the for for this type of platform that we can focus on on development of our technology and increasing the technological readiness level of this technology while not necessarily focusing on, on all these limiting factors such as batteries and so on okay thank you so much of course watts i'm sorry i couldn't change in my head w to watts 
Okay, another question is for you, um, Yaroslav from Carlos. In Oscar Cube, is any preparation of, of the sample to be analyzed needed? Um, I'll repeat the question again. In Oscar Cube, is any preparation of the sample to be analyzed needed? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I exactly understand the question, but the the diamond sample is specifically tuned for for this for this application. So if if we want to use the diamond for magnetometry, then we need to have the NV centers in there. The nitrogen vacancy centers because it's it's a nitrogen which is incorporated inside of the crystalline lattice of the diamond. It is because we we live in the atmosphere which is fully full of nitrogen, then it incorporates automatically. So there is always certain degree of, of NV centers. But for our application, we chose the one which, which is which is with high content of the of the NV centers to actually have enough of signal coming from them, the, the red light and so on. So in, in this respect, but also always you need to tune the, the diamond to have the highest possible performance because the based on the quality of the diamond, you have at the end the, the sensitivities that it, it goes hand in hand. If that answers the question. Thank you so much. Um, Carlos, I hope that answers your question. If you want to elaborate more, please do in the chat. The next question is also to Yaroslav from Wimben, actually. Um, he would like to know, um, he says that I know some space exploration magno magnetometers, which will put its sensor on a robot so that the sensor is far from the mechanical part, lowering the noise. But I see your diamond sensor is inside the box. So how do you avoid the effect from the mechanical part? So it's it's actually not about the, the mechanical parts. It's it's about the the electric currents and other other noises that are that are there. And this is actually one of the one of the things that we want to that we want to try and demonstrate on on board the the ISS that because of the operation principles of of the diamond, you can you can actually distinguish the signals coming from and you can you can distinguish them both on temporal and spatial scales because you actually have the four different orientations from which you can detect the magnetic field you know from where the the source from where the magnetic field is coming that's that's first thing and second because of you can actually measure it fast you can also distinguish different frequencies of, of the magnetic field and then you can better identify from which source is it coming? And that what we are trying to do is to distinguish what is what is actually the contribution of the magnetic field of the Earth versus what is the contribution of the ISS. And also we can go one step further. There is something that I didn't mention in the presentation, but you can also use the diamond in in pulsed operation. What I described was was continuous wave wave operation, but with this pulsed operation, you can actually tune your pulse sequence in a way that it either negates completely the, the AC or focuses on, on certain frequency of the AC magnetic field. So that way you can actually do the filtering of the magnetic field, which is very unique for this technology. So it's a little bit more, more deeper, but yeah, we can also discuss later on. OK, thank you very much. Um, if you have any more questions, you can reach out to them directly as well, because I believe some of them had their um, email addresses on their presentations. Um, also, um, going back to um, Michael's um, question, I saw Alvaro writing that you can overcome a lot of the barriers if you co collaborate with a domestic entity. Um, and that's definitely a way to work with space agencies. Um, so I think that was wonderful advice as well. OK, I see no more questions. This is your last call. So I don't see any more. If you have any, um, you can write it in the questionnaire form as well. So thank you so much to all the speakers, to Hilda, Yaroslav, and Alvaro. Thank you so much for these amazing presentations. OK, um, before we finish the webinar, I'd like to really mention next week, same time, same place, we will have our webinar on the UN USA opportunities. And as I've mentioned in the beginning, we will have the drop test eighth round questionnaire um question and answer session as well so if you're interested in applying to drop test because drop test is a wonderful um experiment a wonderful opportunity to really do technology demonstration so please make sure to check that out and um please make sure to answer our questionnaire form before you leave we really want to hear your feedback because we really want to provide better webinars for you so please make sure to answer that 
Okay, so thank you so much to all the speakers again. Thank you so much for the crowd, as you can hear. Um, we have a lot of messages popping in the chat. So thank you so much for engaging with us. And I hope to see you again next week. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye.